Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to welcome you to the UN Water Seminar on the Water Energy Nexus. It's a pleasure to have you all here in the afternoon. And since this uh, session is being webcast, I also welcome those of you who are joining us online. Uh, my name is Zafar Adil. I'm the director of United Nations University Institute for Water, Environment, and Health uh, based in Canada. And I will be your moderator for this uh, session today. Uh, we have an exciting panel uh, that will take us through a whole range of issues around UN, uh, around uh, water energy nexus. And uh, we also have uh, some interesting uh, teasers from the World Water Development Report that we will be sharing with you uh, this afternoon. The report comes out uh, next year, but we already have some, uh, as I said, interesting teasers that we share with you. To start off the, uh, the conversation, uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Bert Dupoon uh, from UN Habitat to give some opening remarks. Uh, he serves as the Vice Chair of UN Water, which as many of you know is a a collaboration mechanism amongst 30 UN organizations, agencies. Um, so, Bert, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm very um, honored that, we, uh, that you give me the floor in my capacity as Vice Chair UN Water. Okay, World Water Day, uh, the themes, uh, is a very important activity for UN Water. It is really one area where we have made tremendous progress over the last years. Uh, we uh, we we, we do celebrate World Water Day uh, in a specific uh, city, a host city, and we run specific events, but we also have a very active website and where we post background documentation. And we see now uh, that World Water Day is now being celebrated all over the world, being at schools, being at uh, universities, being at provinces and so on, local authorities. So that makes this whole campaign a very, very strengthful um, event. And uh, so therefore, we're also very careful in selecting our themes. And, uh, but this one, uh, water and energy, of course, is very, very, very relevant. We also have to thank um, the Stockholm um, CV, the organizers, we have a uh, memorandum of understanding with them uh, that they will align this theme of their, uh, from the Water Week with the theme of, uh, of the UN uh, World Water Day. And they allow us to, there's also a tradition that we have once one first seminar uh, ahead of next year, and that's the one we are talking about today, uh, that really sets the tone and, and provides and gives the receives the first input uh, from the participants, uh, allowing also CB to further, uh, further sharpen their program for next year. So that's, uh, that's the idea. So this one is a, a sort of testing ground uh, to see what are the relevant topics. Uh, I know that Torkel and his team, the scientific committee, have already elaborated very much on, uh, on, on this area. Um, I, uh, I was happy to, to get a teaser from uh, Rick. Rick is, uh, uh, we know each other for a long time, and uh, I told him what are the main issues what are, what are we talking about and then I was then he showed me the demand for energy how much that will increase and uh, I did was shocking and I don't want to use your figure you want to present your figures yourself but it was also very shocking to see that although we may talk about biofuels we may talk about uh, sustainable energy that it will remain a very small portion of the whole energy demand and at the end of the day it will be coal, it will be gas and so on, that, uh, that, is, uh, that is, will be rely on. So it means that we should maybe also not only have a better understanding between the energy guys and, and the water people, but that we also have the people from climate change there, because it, these are enormous repercussions there. So maybe we, uh, we should uh, think about not only about water and energy, but we should again have a nexus as well, say water, energy and climate change, and add that as an important element. Uh, so that was my first uh, reaction. Of course, you and Habitat, we we are being presented here uh, as my agency. Uh, we are the city's agency. We know, all know urbanization takes place at an enormous rate, and, uh, and the people will live in cities, and cities are the consumers of both energy and, and water, so the integration is very much relevant for cities. And uh, so, ideally, you have done, a, so far already, you have done a great job by getting all these people here, and I'm also, sure, I'm also confident that you are an excellent moderator for your panel. And on behalf of you, Water, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Bert, and you've uh, certainly set the tone and the, uh, to some extent, the agenda of what we are to discuss in terms of the range of issues. Uh, so thank you very much again. What I would like to do is to start with uh, an overview of, uh, of 
some of the issues that we're going to tackle as well as give you a brief overview of what the planning is for the World Water Day at this point in time. So I'll just move over there. So the topic uh, um, for the seminar as well as for the uh, World Water Day next year will be the nexus between water and energy. And this is a joint venture that uh, United Nations University and uh, UNIDO, the U UN Industrial Development Organization, will be taking on behalf of the UN community as a whole. And we will also be in partnership with the World Water Assessment Program. And I'll come back to that in a mo moment. So thematically, there's a whole range of issues that we can look at, uh, and, and Bert has just mentioned uh, some of them. In terms of energy generation, there, there are very close links with, uh, with water. Obviously, for hydropower, uh, water is uh, quite crucial. But also in terms of thermal and nuclear energy, uh, proximity to water resources, and uh, sometimes impacts for, from uh, uh, energy generation on water uh, resources are quite obvious. And as we focus more and more on renewables, uh, there is, again, uh, a, a footprint of those on, on in terms of water uh, footprint of those um, approaches. Similarly, more recently, uh, when we've started discussing access to energy, uh, uh, many of you would know the, the issues that surround and sometimes the controversy that surrounds shale gas and fracking uh, opportunities. And similarly, for biofuels, there is a very heated debate going on in terms of the relationship with energy generation through biofuels and the impact on, uh, on water resources. When you invert that equation and look at uh, how water treatment and uh, supply and distribution are linked to energy resources, globally we know that about 8% of the global energy consumption is for treating water, for supplying, pumping it uh, to where it's needed. Uh, and. Uh, it also is uh, the, the quantity and the quality of that water is also uh, connected to, to the energy sector, uh, sometimes uh, perhaps negatively in terms of the chemical and thermal uh, pollution to, to water resources. And there is also an interesting case that we will discuss in a bit more depth uh, in the panel discussion, is the co-production of water and energy, uh, uh, most particularly in the case of uh, geothermal options which are available. So I'm trying not to go into details of any of these issues because uh, we have a very distinguished panel that will walk us through those. What is important to remember is that there is an increasing demand for both water and energy, and those demands are going to be significant and they will increase as a result of climate change as we move forward. There's also now, as you've seen in many of the sessions here, uh, a very heated uh, discussion and dialogue around the uh, post-2015 agenda and more specifically around the development of sustainable development goals and how they link to, to uh, uh, water-related uh, uh, goals and targets. But around that whole uh, debate around the post-2015 uh, development agenda, there's a number of links uh, that, that we can explore further. Water and energy security are uh, quite critical, and, and there's a bit of a geographic overlap. Uh, we know, for example, in Sub-Saharan Africa, energy availability is low, and water availability is also low. And that happens in many uh, developing regions of the world. There's a link with the notion of green economy, and particularly when we talk about robust and climate resilient economic growth, uh, you have to take into account this nexus between water and energy. And similarly for gender inequities, uh, we find that, again, similar type of inequities uh, 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 come into play. And in many developing countries, women spend an inordinate amount of time fetching not only water, but also uh, burning wood for, for cooking. And again, those inequities need to be addressed as part of the overall post-2015 uh, agenda. There are uh, development uh, links as well. Uh, in terms of looking at uh, empowering economic opportunities, creation of new jobs, and eventually using those as levers to reduce poverty. And again, having water and energy uh, is, is a critical element of, of those uh, strategies. Uh, similarly, creation of policy incentives, uh, 
we need to have this kind of cross-linkage uh, between water and energy policies, and that's absolutely <coughs> cru crucial to move forward. And finally, in terms of implementation, uh, one of the points that we've looked at over the last few years is this notion of bottom billion. These are the billion people who are without access to uh, energy or modern forms of energy. They also uh, typically don't have access to clean and safe water and don't have access to sanitation. And the point is that uh, from their perspective, it's actually very useful to go in and provide these resources all at the same time rather than parceling it out one at a time. And of course, uh, there is a big focus on increasing efficiency uh, in both water and energy generation as well as, as, well as its delivery to, its, uh, to the consumers. And uh, in order to achieve all of this, there is a need for engagement with stakeholders. And again, there's a fairly broad range that goes from the industrial manufacturing sector, power sector, and I wouldn't call water as a sector, but the international water community uh, has to be engaged, civil society organizations, academic and research community, and of course, not the least, uh, uh, international development partners and donors uh, also need to be uh, plugged into the equation. So this sort of gives you a thumbnail sketch of uh, the kind of issues that are at play. And these will be discussed at the World Water Day event, uh, and uh, which are, uh, UN Water has a main event in one location, but they're actually spread out across the world. I'm quite pleased to also reveal, perhaps for the first time, the, the logo that has been designed uh, for the World Water Day, and it, it's a nice overlap of energy waves and, uh, and a water droplet. Uh, so this you will be seeing a lot of between now and the World Water Day next year. Let me briefly introduce uh, the components of, uh, of this uh, World Water Day. The, the most uh, prominent objective of World Water Day is to raise awareness on these water energy linkages. Uh, we hope that uh, that discussion contributes to the overall policy dialogue, uh, which should cover a whole range of issues, and I just pointed out uh, some of those. There's also a need for actively engaging the various stakeholders inside of those, uh, those uh, discussion boxes. And at the end of the day, we need to be able to demonstrate to decision makers, uh, policy makers, politicians, that uh, these integrated approaches where you take into account this water energy nexus more explicitly, you can actually have a bigger impact in terms of uh, social and economic benefits that you get at the end of the day. We will also focus on uh, the policy dimension uh, and look at uh, how policy formulation can take place to, uh, to enhance the implementation around uh, water energy nexus. And at the same time, we also know many developing countries don't have the resources for, uh, for implementing those, and hence capacity development becomes a, uh, a pretty central uh, element of that. And I've already talked about how these link back to the 2015, uh, post-2015 development agenda. And again, we will make an effort to take the messages from various World Water Day events and funnel them back into that uh, dialogue. We will also uh, focus on uh, uh, presenting the findings from the United Nations World Water Development Report, and we will later on uh, give you a teaser from uh, what's in that report, which is also focusing on this uh, linkage between water and energy. And finally, we want to, as UN Water, we want to strengthen the engagement and uh, cooperation across the UN agencies and organizations. And as many of you who are familiar with UN Water would know that that cooperation is not just limited to the UN system itself, but is actually expanded to include uh, quite a broad range of uh, players and stakeholders. Uh, and we're quite interested that how UN Water collaborates with UN Energy, which is also a similar uh, global coordination mechanism in the UN system. What are the elements of this campaign, I, I would like to call it? Uh, it's, we see this as a, uh, an, uh, an opportunity for engaging globally on these issues of uh, water and energy. And we provide, uh, we meaning UN Water, provides uh, support to worldwide events. We offer a platform in, on which you can advertise. Uh, you can try to engage people through this platform. 
We provide promotional and informational materials, which include advocacy guide, posters, uh, fact sheets, graphics, etc. So there's a whole range of uh, uh, um, whole range of uh, tools that are available for those who are interested in organizing uh, events in their own uh, neighborhood or in their own communities. And what we've seen over the last few years uh, that the numbers of events and numbers of people who are engaging through this uh, mechanism has, uh, has grown uh, logarithmically. And so there's an increasing number of events and uh, people who are engaged. Uh, another successful element we had uh, this year was to have an international competition for identifying a slogan for the World Water Day. Uh, and uh, again, it's a great tool for engaging particularly youth in, in this dialogue and to identify what, what general perceptions are around a particular issue. There's a World Water Day website which is also maintained by UN Water and it offers information in multiple languages. There's also a social media campaign that UN Water undertakes, and this online community has also been growing uh, very significantly. As you can see from the numbers here, there are 34,000 likes on Facebook, uh, 12,000 followers on Twitter, and about 7,000 uh, people who receive the UN Water newsletter. So there's, there's a very large footprint uh, on the social media uh, that, that takes place. And of course, we don't uh, ignore the traditional media and, and again, uh, the UN agencies that are uh, involved in these processes collaborate uh, and together with our international partners, we take the messages forward to the, uh, to the traditional media as well. The main uh, World Water Day event will be in, uh, in Tokyo next year and this will be on 20th and 21st of March, so we're doing it a day ahead of the actual celebrated World Water Day, uh, which falls on a Saturday. Uh, so the festivities will actually continue through the World Water Day. Let me share with you briefly a sketch of what we are intending to do. On 20th March, there will be two major workshops. One will focus on the Asia Pacific region and look at uh, what scientific and research issues are there. We will bring in various stakeholders from the region, and again, try to bring out the same series of issues uh, that, that I just touched on, and how do they play out in that regional context. We're also planning a capacity development workshop for journalists, and in the past, we found such an exercise to be really useful because uh, uh, journalists are often not very familiar with these uh, specific topics, and by introducing them to various thematic issues, providing them advocacy and guidance materials, uh, we find that uh, their capacity is built uh, quite significantly, and we do this through a series of interactive dialogues. There will be a main event on 21st of March, uh, where uh, they, we will start with a high-level uh, policy dialogue. There will also be a number of working level dialogues. Uh, as I hinted at the World Water Development Report, which focuses on this water en energy nexus, will be launched uh, in, uh, in Tokyo. And we will, as usual, have some artistic uh, depiction uh, through music, through dance, through photography and art ex exhibitions on, on where these, uh, these connections between water and energy play out. And we're also aiming to have a, uh, a technology exhibition. As you can imagine, uh, in Japan, there's a, a very uh, high focus and interest on, on technologies. And we're hoping that that will be enhanced by bringing in other international uh, partners and players to display their technologies uh, in, in this arena. As is the tradition for World Water Day events, uh, we will also announce the Water for Life Award, uh, which, is, which recognizes uh, best practices around the world. It's, a, it's an award that is given out by UN Water. And also the, uh, the laureate for the Stockholm uh, Water Prize is uh, also traditionally announced uh, at, the, uh, at the World Water Day. So we're uh, looking forward to that as well. So what is it that we want to achieve by uh, doing all these activities, not just in Tokyo, but across the world. We want to identify uh, the, the linkages between the scientific work and research and policy. And 
how do we use those to move forward and to address where, where the gaps lie at the moment? Uh, and we're, we're planning to produce a policy brief uh, which will extract this information and which will uh, based on, be based on the two dialogues that I mentioned uh, in Tokyo in particular. And in fact, the discussions that we are to have this afternoon are also going to be uh, quite uh, directly contributing to that. We want to mobilize a stakeholder dialogue. So the World Water Day event is not an end in itself, but it's actually a continuation of uh, this discussion moving forward. We also want, particularly being in the UN system, to identify what the capacity needs are and uh, perhaps catalyze action to meet those needs as we move forward. And we think that UN Water can play a very significant role in, uh, in meeting those. And finally, uh, from uh, UN Water, we want to synthesize messages and also take actions uh, that, that uh, propel us forward. And as you heard from Bert, uh, that the World Water Week next year will focus on the same topic. So we hope that some of our messages will be carried forward to here in Stockholm and we will have a follow-up dialogue here as well. So that's all uh, I had uh, in terms of the content. I do want to mention again uh, the partners that we have uh, so far in this, uh, in this coalition, uh, United Nations University, my particular institute on water, environment, and health, UNIDO, uh, UNESCO, the World Water Assessment Program, uh, the Japanese government, particularly the Ministry of Infrastructure, the University of Tokyo, and we also have uh, City of Kumamoto, which is the winner of this year's Water for Life Award, uh, is also coming on board as a partner. So we're hoping to look forward to see you all, uh, not just in Tokyo, but around the world. So thank you very much for your attention. So we have a tradition uh, that each year a UN agency takes the role of uh, playing the host for uh, World Water Day. Uh, this year, the focus was on inter, uh, international water cooperation, and uh, UNESCO led the charge with that. So let me invite uh, Blanca to come up and uh, say a few words about, uh, uh, about the achievements for the World Water Day this year and also to pass on the baton to UNU and UNIDA. So, Blanca, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adil. As I am still a new for, for a lot of people, let me introduce myself. I'm Blanca Jimenez. I'm the secretary of the International Hydrological Program and the director of the Division of Water Science at UNESCO. I was just uh, realizing now that this, uh, this uh, World Water Day was the 20th. And it started from being an event organized by the, all the UN agencies together, now by being organized by some uh, agencies on behalf of UN Water. I think that as UN we have moved uh, and we have uh, really show that we can first collaborate at, in, the U, in the UN system and that we have uh, managed to uh, mobilize uh, the people. So uh, this day UNESCO was in charge of uh, organizing this uh, day on behalf of UN Water in collaboration with UNESCO and UNDESA. In our case, the day took place on the 22 March, which is the official date for the World Water Day, and it was held in The Hague. But at the same time, we had a high-level uh, interactive dialogue with the 67th session of the UN General Assembly in New York. I think that was very important because we really uh, were linked to policymakers from, uh, and politicians from the whole uh, country. As was mentioned, the theme for us was cooperation, and still this event is part of this International Year Water of uh, Cooperation. And to summarize in some figures uh, what we have achieved, we have uh, three different web, web pages. The UNESCO web page that it was uh, uh, presented in, six, in the six official UN languages. A UN Waters web page that has uh, had more than 60,000 uh, visitors only for that day, and the Dutch government web page. 
We have uh, 30,000 followers in the Facebook, more than 10,000 followers in Twitter, uh, more than 200 uh, views, uh, 200,000 views of uh, the YouTube uh, videos that we have. At the day, we have 421 participants in The Hague, and around the world, more than 800 events took place around the World Water Day. These events were very, very different. It, it went from theaters, performances, to graffitis, using this, uh, this idea of uh, show displaying through graffiti water. I think it's something that was uh, really very interesting to to realize, and walks for water. People were carrying water for one kilometer, two kilometer, and that happened in different uh, co uh, countries, not only in Europe, we had that in The Hague, but it happened in Asia, Africa, uh, and uh, Latin America. Thinking, uh, try to, uh, to think uh, as UNESCO, what was important for us, I think, uh, it was indeed a very gratifying task because two, because two reasons. First, because we were celebrating the World Water Day, and secondly, because we really managed to show the importance of cooperation. After listening to the plans that you and you and UNIDO have, I think that we are sure that they are going to do a very nice work. You know, uh, UNESCO can still cooperate and support you with anything that uh, we could do for help you. And I'm sure that it will be a complete uh, success. And where is Christian? Ah, okay. This symbol, which is also a contribution uh, of UNESCO to UN Water, represents the World Water Day, and we are handling it officially to our okay. colleagues. Well, and please take a look uh, of it. but I think you should put in the same, you should cooperate and put it in that. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Congratulations. Please give them another round of applause. Thank you very much. I invite my partner in crime, uh, Mr. Christian Susan from UNIDO, to say a few words uh, on behalf of UNIDO. Thank you very much, Adele. Well, for UNIDO, it's an honor and a pleasure to cooperate in this important issue with the United Nations University. The key core mandate of UNIDO is to promote green industries. These are industries which sustain economic development, whereas their detrimental impact on the environment and on social structures is minimized. So this decoupling, delinking of growth from resource consumption to make industries more resource efficient. And there can be no industrial process which doesn't involve water or energy. And in this role, our previous director general, Dr. Candium Keller, acted also as the head, the chair of UN Energy. We are looking forward to this cooperation and thank you very much, Adele. And see you, everyone. I hope to become active stakeholders and participants in the 2014 events to celebrate World Water Day. It's not a UN event alone, it's an event for everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so we move on to the uh, exciting uh, part around discussion. So let me invite all the panelists to join us here on the stage. While they're making their way up the stage, let me also share with you the process that we will follow. We will start off by giving each of the panelists uh, the opportunity to make a short intervention uh, for about, uh, I would say, seven, eight minutes. And that will allow us to leave ample time for a very interactive dialogue. Uh, and we wa want all of you to be very much uh, a part of that uh, dialogue as we move forward. Uh, what is interesting about this panel is, uh, and I'll introduce each of them as I invite them to offer uh, comments, is that it's actually bringing in a wide range of perspectives and backgrounds. And, and that 
helps us enormously uh, in terms of uh, moving forward and in uh, identifying the various range of issues that, that we need to address. So I will go in the order of uh, the, the listed uh, uh, panelists. And the first one is uh, Mr. Zalelam uh, Gebrihot. I'm not sure if I'm doing justice to your last name. My apologies for that. Uh, but he's with the East African uh, Power Pool. And uh, I would say it would be fair to say you represent uh, the energy sector and its uh, perspectives. So the floor is yours. And we'd like to hear, um, as I said, uh, for perhaps about uh, uh, seven, eight minutes. Thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Moderator. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, indeed a pleasure to speak in front of this panel and, uh, of course, uh, expect a lot to learn from the panel as well and from you at large. S Mr. Moderator, let me start by introducing the Eastern Africa Power Pool. Uh, Eastern Africa Power Pool is an intergovernmental regional organization established in 2005 through the signing of an intergovernmental memorandum of understanding with 10 Eastern Africa countries. Our members, uh, to name our members, uh, Burundi, Democratic Republic, Congo, Egypt, Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Sudan, Uganda, Tanzania, um, Libya, Ethiopia and Egypt. The APP is established with a mission uh, for pooling and wheeling of electrical energy resources in a coordinated and optimized manner to enable provision of affordable, sustainable, and reliable electrical energy throughout the region. And the further objective was also to establish electricity market in the long term. At that time, there was a common understanding between the members that the energy deficit in the region can be substantially reduced through greater inter-country electricity trade and cross-border power sharing at this time has become a strategic priority for all of the Eastern Africa countries and that is supported by the continental and regional, organi regional organizations like the Africa Union Commission, the Common Market for Eastern and Southern Africa, Eastern Africa Community and the New Partnership for Africa's Development, NEPAD, and among others. And in line with that, the countries in the region uh, years ago uh, have embarked upon the development and operation of power system interconnection projects through bilateral arrangements. Uh, to name a few which are now in operation are the Ethiopia Sudan uh, 230 KV interconnection line and the Ethiopia Djibouti interconnection line, the cross border power exchange between Kenya and Ethiopia, and uh, interconnection between Uganda and Kenya, and in the Great Lakes region, Burundi, Eastern DRC, and Rwanda. And the remaining major interconnection projects are expected to be commissioned by on or before 2018. That includes the 1,100 kilometer, uh, 500 kV AC DC line between Ethiopia and Kenya. By the time that line is commissioned, we would have an opportunity to exchange power between nine of our member countries and we believe that, uh, in effect, avails the opportunity to develop energy projects which provides least cost power on a sustainable basis, in addition to optimal use of the existing available capacity. And as such, such opportunity for least cost development of new generation facilities, as well as optimal use of the existing capacity would entail consideration of the broader water energy nexus at best to ensure sustainability. When we look at the Eastern Africa Power Pool Regional Master Plan published on May 2011, the, the generation plans which formed the basis 
of the regional master plan constitute a diversified portfolio of generation projects. Um, for example, looking at the generation expansion plan for the year between 2013 and 38, that's a 25 years planning horizon. The proportion of hydropower ranges from a minimum of 4% in one of the member countries, which is Kenya, to 84% in the DRC system. Looking at the whole of the EAPP system, hydropower would constitute only 40% of the total generation capacity by the end of the planning horizon. That is based on the master plan published in, on May 2011. But this configuration is expected to change in the forcible update of the master plan uh, to take place within the next two years. Um, and again, uh, that's about the recommended plan for the long term, but whether the recommended power generation project is especially just beyond the first five years, the initial years, um, or whether they are water smart is required to be studied further and the findings to be employed as an input to the future updates of the regional master plan. So as I stated earlier, the EAPP constitutes 10 member countries. The average electricity access at this stage is about 20%, and the average per capita consumption is less than 100 kilowatt per year, which is almost the lowest in the world. That is without considering Egypt. But as confirmed by the various studies, the region is endowed with vast hydropower and geothermal generation potential, which is the two together in the order of 180,000 megawatt capacity yet to be tapped to improve the existing situation. Hydropower constitutes only 30% of the total installed capacity in the existing system, looking at the whole of APP as a whole. And it is even, the, com the contribution is less in terms of energy generation capacity Geothermal in the existing system could be termed insignificant in the order of few hundred megawatts. As the depicted hydro capacity in the existing system represents 9% of the economically developed potential in the region, it's rational to expect significant hydropower and other renewable resource development in the region to improve the future generation mix as well as access to modern energy service. As such, this highlights the need to explore the future water energy nexus in the region to guide the required huge energy and water infrastructure ex expansion in the direction of sustainability. As the power systems are vulnerable to water scarcity and also have impact on water availability to downstream users. Needless to say, hydropower does not consume any water except evaporative losses from the dam, but there is a need to be to do careful assessment to develop water smart hydropower dams with less evaporation losses within a regional cooperative framework and provide access to cost effective power to member countries through interconnected power systems. So we in the Eastern Africa Power Pool, um, at this stage, all the studies um, are considering uh, as much renewable energy as possible in the expansion plans, but most of it is basically guided by least cost power development considerations. Mr. Moderator, that's what I have for this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was indeed a very interesting uh, overview of um, a region where both water and energy issues are quite critical. And I think it also offers us a good segue to the next panelist, uh, Dr. Ingvar uh, Friedlifsen, who is the past uh, director of uh, United Nations University Geothermal Training Program in Iceland. So, Ingvar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, I do not need to explain to you that water, of course, is one of the primary needs. Water and air, if we haven't got these, then we wouldn't be living. But then the third factor, which is very important, and that is energy. P 
people used mainly muscular energy, but gradually we have been able to make use of other types of energy, electricity and, and the water and so on. So in, uh, and, and that is really where energy and water come together, that is in the, in the water energy sector, because we are, we, in, in geothermal, we are dealing with water also, but some of the water comes out of the ground as steam, and that is fortunately already now providing about 20% of the electricity in, in Kenya, and uh, there, are enorm there is an enormous potential in the whole of the East Africa Rift Valley, and uh, which we are looking very much forward to seeing the development of and are participating very much in doing, as I will come to later. But uh, energy consumption is one of the factors that uh, correspond uh, linearly to the growth in energy consumption to the GNP per capita. So this goes hand in hand, development in a country and the energy use in the country, that's to say, because people are getting the machines to, 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 to work for them. But also there is a very uh, good and linear uh, um, correspondence between the energy use and the lifetime expectancy, uh, the illiteracy uh, and energy use, etc. But in my opinion, uh, one of the key issues to discuss in the water energy nexus is capacity building of professionals from the developing countries, uh, where uh, in most developing countries there are very few people who have expert training in this field. And uh, the government of Iceland and the United Nations University established the United Nations Geothermal Training Program in Iceland in 1979. And uh, within the UNU, for UNU fellowships, there are very strict conditions. Number one, the candidates, they must have a university degree uh, uh, um, and a job within either an energy company or, or, uh, or a university in a developing country. Uh, they must have a, a, a permanent job. And when we select them, we select them all by private interviews. We go to the countries and we visit the main uh, companies or, or ministries uh, involved. We visit the facilities, we see the equipment that they have in the laboratories and so on, and go to the geothermal fields. And uh, we select every single fellow by a personal interview. And then those we offer a fellowship, they have to write and sign that they will be working with their company or university for at least three years after they get back. And similarly, the company has to sign a certificate that they will be working in geothermal at least for three years after the training. Otherwise, we can send an invoice for the training cost. And uh, this has been very, very effective and we have nine specialized lanes or lines of training going from geology to hydrology to surface geophysical exploration to downhole geophysical exploration, uh, drilling, engineering, uh, as well as chemistry and environment. And as a matter of fact, the largest group of uh, our, uh, our students have come from Kenya, uh, 89 out of the out of the 554 uh, graduates. And uh, the second number, highest number is 82 from China. But uh, about half of all our, all our graduates have come from the East Africa Rift Valley. And that is also where we are training and ha having annual courses for people from the East Africa Rift countries. And uh, I think it is very important in the water energy nexus to apply not only for, for geothermal, but also for hydro and water, uh, some training mechanism that takes top people who have just started working in the developing countries, take them abroad, away from their office, and, and train them, and then follow up the training after they get back home. And this is uh, in Kenya, for instance, the top person of GTC, as well as the technical director of, of Kenshin, both of them were trained in Iceland 20 to 25 years ago. 
and uh, the, the tops in almost every specialty with these companies have been, have been trained with us, and we are very proud of this. And uh, <coughs> the government of Iceland has uh, done the same thing with re uh, had very good cooperation with the United Nations University, and on the 20th anniversary of the geothermal program, a fisheries training program was set up, and uh, they already have uh, uh, about 270 uh, graduates from uh, about 50 countries, developing countries, most of them from Africa, but also quite a lot from, 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 from Asia. And uh, then uh, on the 10th anniversary of the fisheries training program, 30th anniversary of ours, then the land restoration training program was set up, and the land restoration training program is built in the same way as the geothermal and fisheries, same selection method, and they are working in, in arid lands in, in uh, desert areas. And Adil can tell you more about that than me because he is on the board of directors of that program. But uh, I, I, I think that capacity building uh, is perhaps the most important issue. And uh, this is something that we uh, very much need uh, both in the water and in the energy, and even more so in, in the water, I, I believe, because of how import, wa important water is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingvar. Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate your highlighting this need for capacity development, and it's an issue that we will come back to when we go into the discussion mode. Our next panelist doesn't really need any introduction, uh, but I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Torgny Holmgren, the director of Stockholm International Water Institute. Uh, Torgny, you have the floor. Uh, thanks a lot, and thanks a lot for bringing me to this panel and this most interesting subject, which we will have as a main focus of next year's World Water Week, Energy and Water. So let me take the freedom to be a panelist to do some uh, speculation towards the end of my intervention on what will happen in the next few years. But I will start off with commenting and reflecting upon common features between energy and water and also see the asymmetries uh, in water and energy and see what might happen over the next few years. Uh, as has been mentioned here, we know that uh, both energy and water, of course, are basic requirements for human life, food production, for our survival, shelter, etc. So uh, it's very close linkages, as we know, between a correlation between water and energy. Water is needed for energy production and also energy for water supply. So that is common, basic needs for human life. Second, we know that there is a huge increase in demand for both energy and water in the next few years. According to International Energy Agency, the demand for water will, or for energy, of course, will be some 50% higher just 20 years from now. And uh, as we know that OECD has estimation that the water demand will increase by some 55% up to 2050. So it's a huge increase in demand, thanks and or due to, if you wish, to, to growing populations and growing economies. So there is a, a challenge both in the energy sector and in the water sector to meet that increased demand. So that is also in common. And I also often claim that water and energy also are true global goods or issues. You have the same kind of challenges, irrespective if you live in Texas or in Burkina Faso when it comes to energy and water. Of course, you need different maybe technical solutions to handle the challenges, but on water you have droughts and floods and scarcity coming up wherever you are in the world. And on energy, of course, it's the same maybe on different dimensions and levels, but that is in common. And I think that by finding technical solutions in different parts of the world, we could uh, learn from each other both to handle water <coughs> and energy. So that is also in common in energy production and in the water supply. That was in common. Now the asymmetries, and they are many, but I will focus on institutional, technical, and economic asymmetries and start with institutional, and there is quite a wide gap in between the energy and water sectors. Energy, it's mainly, or mainly, it's going to be mainly privately uh, distributed and privately owned and privately also organized. And here you have nationwide, regional, global companies providing energy, 
oil companies you have in this area of the world, in the Baltic area states, we have a common uh, electricity network between uh, Denmark, Sweden, Finland, Sweden, the Baltic states, etc. So it's a common pool of electricity. And of course, uh, in that sense also, we have uh, pricing set on a global market. So energy is very cross-border. You, you handle it on a global market, regional market, etc. So that is an institutional feature which is quite different from the water, which is still mainly public utility run. You have local, local utilities uh, supplying water in the local market and uh, sometimes maybe semi-local. But that's a huge difference in providing energy and providing water. On technical side, the scarcity of energy or the increased demand, I will rather say, has led to huge uh, and technical advancements in energy efficiency. Uh, I think all over the world nowadays you you calculate what kind of uh, the fuel consumption in your car. That didn't, wasn't the case 20 years ago. You, need, you also need, uh, well, you are asking for household appliances, how much energy does this uh, refrigerator consume, etc. So you are very, very well aware of the energy use by your, by your appliance or by your car or by transport means, etc. Also in, in, plant, in plants, in production plants also, because energy is such a huge costs in most um, production and manufacturing industry. So that has led to an increase in energy efficiency. We today, we produce more with less energy than we did some 20, 25 years ago. Uh, that is still to be done in the water sector. Of course, things are happening here. And as we heard yesterday, our Stockholm Industry Water Award, Award Prize, uh, Netafim with the drip and micro irrigation schemes. So it's in the coming, but far beyond still what is happening on the energy markets. And uh, uh, still, uh, we are not aware of, in most places of the world, the consumption of uh, water in our households, what it means, etc., for costing, <coughs> also in appliances that we use. Uh, it, it's coming, I would say, in different parts of the world, but still far beyond what is happening on the energy sector. And economically, the third feature, which I think is a key a symmetry between the water and energy sector is, is, the, is the, that energy is set uh, pricing on the global market. It's basically, as I mentioned, the private, private around companies that have it, and it's priced on the market. You know, uh, well, here you can, in our country, you can calculate hour by hour what you consume and the energy cost. And as I mentioned on, on transport, you know exactly what kind of uh, the cost is and uh, what the, the amount of energy you use. Um, so pricing has led also in the increased demand to a, a, a awareness of the cost of, of, of but not only for households but also of course mainly in the manufacturing industry. Uh, while water uh, is, uh, well, cost sharing pricing or, or cost coverage pricing, I mean, and the marginal cost pricing which is quite different from the energy sector, which is more or less on the demand supply curve. And uh, we have, here we have local markets. In Sweden, we, I think uh, each municipality has its own water utility, some 280s, compared to on the energy side, we, we have four or five giants, the EU on Vattenfall and some others. So there's a huge uh, uh, asymmetry there in the market basic structure. And my question now is, what will happen in the next few years? Do we see merger? Do we see that the water sector is coming close to the energy sector when it comes to institutional, technical, and economic solutions? And now I'm very much into the guesstimates of what will happen in the next few years, and that is what I would like also to discuss with you in the years to come, but also, of course, today in this, in this panel. Well, uh, I guess, and this is my guess or estimate right now, that on the technology side, yes, I think there would be uh, huge increases in more water efficient use of uh, or efficient use of water in, in the years to come. We have seen it in the, into, into coming and in the making. Uh, on the economic side, yes, I guess, guess that uh, sooner or later we will see some pricing on water. That is what I hear from, from uh, manufacturing industry and also from agriculture and from other sectors that pricing will drive innovation also. With the scarcity, with the increased demand, there will need to be some valuation how pricing is done, that is a thousand million dollar question, whether it's tariffs, taxes, or quotas, regulations, or pricing on the market, ownership, etc. But it's, there is a, I see more and more of demand and a, a need for pricing to drive the efficiency that is needed in, in water. But 
still some years to come. Institutional, I'm a bit less sure that we will see global water uh, production or water supplying companies, the Exxon of water, but uh, well, you don't know yet. You cannot speculate what will happen 20 or 30 years from now, but I guess more and more we will see at least sub-national, maybe national companies taking care and not supplying water and more of pricing and more of uh, technology advancement in the water sector. And of course, that will also impact energy because water is a huge part also of energy production, so that in, in turn will lead to more energy efficiency in the years to come. That was my speculation. Thanks. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Torgny, for pointing us forward and, and trying to sort of look behind the curve. I, I particularly like your idea of looking at asymmetries because we're, a lot of times when we're discussing the nexus and interlinkages, we're interested more on uh, the commonalities, but I think there are some stark differences as well. Another one I would point to is that the investment that's expected in the energy sector over the next 20 years is about $25 trillion, and we don't have anywhere near that uh, coming into the, into the water um, uh, arena, so to speak. So we, we'll look forward to this uh, discussion to continue around the asymmetries. Our next panelist is uh, Mr. John Payne, um, who's representing uh, UNIDO, but uh, also works with the uh, private sector in SNC Lavalin. So, John, you have the floor. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Adele, and UN Water for putting this together. I'm going to make a few observations on behalf of UNIDO on some of the findings and messages about the relationship of water and energy within industry. In this context, the, the focus is manufacturing and extractive industries, not the power generating industry or agriculture, which are generally treated separately. So while industry uses only 19% of all the water withdrawals worldwide, one estimate suggests that the combined direct consumption of five of the large food and beverage companies is enough to provide the basic daily water needs of the world's population. So that's quite a thought. In that context, I guess the first message is that industry has a different position and priorities. Industry is primarily focused on production. Its interest is to secure water and energy at the lowest price, not necessarily in a program of water and energy efficiency. Industry is interested in measuring the total cost-benefit effects of efficiency on profitability whereas governments and civil society are more focused on overall economic results, social benefits, and the environment. This having been said, manufacturing has traditionally been thought of in terms of mass employment, but now, quoting McKinsey, it's a critical driver of innovation, productivity, and competitiveness, and as such, policymakers need to understand the diversity of industry and its position in the wider national and regional economy. And on top of that, the private management structure of industry gives it, a fle gives it flexibility to affect changes, and these changes can be rapid. So the second point is that water and energy relate differently within industry than within other, than within other sectors. Industry's direct interaction with water and energy is primarily at a plant or factory level, which is end use. More sophisticated corporations will consider the value chain upstream and downstream, and here water energy linkages such as embedded water may be more apparent and significant, and there's been quite a bit of discussion on this point in, in other um, seminars at the uh, event this week. In industry as a whole, though, there seems to be less of a nexus between water and energy than, other, than in other spheres. Industry does not commonly evaluate the link between water and energy. They're generally managed separately and tra treated as two independent components and production costs within a process. So it's more of an association that is linked to profit and loss. You can't audit one of them and maybe save some in the other. So this is rather different than the direct connection in power production or municipal engineering where there are more obvious combined efficiencies. However, again, this being said, industry does not seek water and energy, does seek water and energy efficiency. And though the two are not always compatible, there are trade-offs that can be made. 
Efficiency that translates to reduced water and energy use in a plant also has the potential to reduce water and energy stress outside the factory walls. This can happen in the communities and river basins where industry operates, and it also can act as ripple effects back up the supply chain, including the power supply. There are strong differences between large companies, particularly multinationals, and small and medium enterprises, or SMEs. Large industry is well advanced in reacting to water and energy issues. Such large companies see the value in efficiencies in both monetary and societal terms. Small and medium enterprises as a group have the potential for making a significant impact on water and energy efficiencies, but that impact is mostly apparent on a local scale. And they're commonly in need of equity and have fewer resources to improve efficiencies in, the, in a parallel way, there, is, there are large differences between developed and developing countries. Globally, manufacturing output continues to grow in advanced economies by about 2.7% annually, and by about 7.4% in large developing economies. Energy demand is increasing more than in non-OECD countries. In fact, in developing countries, the industrial sector frequently requires more than 50% of energy supply, thus creating economic stress. And water demand is also increasing, particularly in the BRICS countries in Asia. So what are the forces affecting water and energy in industry? Water and energy need to compete for priority in the decision-making process for industrial location. And this is not just with each other in terms of scarcity and allocation and so on that we've heard so much about but also with other factors such as labor costs, availability of skilled labor, access to raw materials, markets, suppliers, transportation, infrastructure, and centers of innovation. In terms of prices, it's more the volatility in energy prices than the availability of energy that affects industry. And the reverse is somewhat true for water. It's the availability of water that is the bigger risk as the price is generally low and stable, though I know there are arguments around that point. The most recent driver is the emphasis on climate change, where a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions is strongly linked to energy use and efficiency. Water use and efficiency opportunities are now following suit, driven in part by climate change and the projected scarcity of water resources. Regulation is also becoming more global. Energy regulation is more directed at energy production and distribution than for its use in industry. But for water resources, the contrast is that regulation generally concerns use and discharge, which has impacts on industry. There is also the fact that better use of energy and water in lower income countries may be the indirect beneficial result of regulations in developed countries with markets and companies that are subject to higher environmental standards. It is also recognized by industry that regulation will shape water econ economics and that regulators' preferences can tilt responses, and the same is also likely true for energy. So this plays off in opportunities and trade-offs. Industry must consider the full range of inputs and the trade-offs between where products are produced and where they are sold. In most cases, the main trade-offs are whether energy savings trump water savings or vice versa, and whether gaining an improvement in water at the expense of energy or vice versa. This is where water productivity intersects with energy efficiency. However, there is also a rebound effect in that although energy efficiency means the same production can be delivered with less energy, in fact, more can be produced with the same amount of energy, and the same effect can be true for water. So for industry, new and developing technology is readily available to improve water productivity and energy efficiency. I'm sure you've all heard about uh, reuse and recycling and reclaimed municipal wastewater and a focus on zero discharge technologies. And Christian has already mentioned the adoption of green technologies within industry for sustainable development. And for small and medium enterprises in particular, and I feel we haven't heard a lot about those this week, UNIDO has set up a national cleaner production program with centers promoting cleaner production practices worldwide. 
They also have a TEST program, which is an acronym for Transfer of Environmentally Sound Technologies to these small and medium enterprises. Moreover, industrial policy has been addressed in terms of target setting agreements, energy management standards, and system optimization. And on top of this, companies can carry out water and energy audits and calculate balances and corresponding footprints. And these are important first steps in setting conservation and efficiency goals and targets. And of course, companies are adopting standards such as ISO 14,000 for the environment, 5,000 for energy management, and LEED for energy and environmental design. These trade-offs highlight the need for balanced optimization. They frequently involve short-term cost increases versus capital investments, which may be perceived as high and risky in the light of longer-term gains, such as low operation and maintenance costs. Capital for investment is frequently limited in industry, and it may be, they may choose to expand capacity to generate more revenue rather than improve efficiency. Notwithstanding this, it's been found that many investments in water productivity show positive results in as little as three years. Trade-offs may also be difficult to see in monetary terms, such as a return on investment, for when a company adopts new paradigms of corporate social responsibility and commits to cleaner production sustainability, the results can be intangible. It's somewhat like goodwill. So within industry, like, like government, those managers responsible for water and energy need to sit down and coordinate their strategies and actions and also talk to their colleagues and counterparts in other parts of that production enterprise to see how they may do things more efficiently and effectively. And finally, many uh, organizations such as WWF, the UN CEO Water Mandate, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and the Alliance for Water Stewardship are working to increase the awareness, leadership, and engagement of the private sector so that companies more fully consider the physical, regulatory, and reputational risks that they face. Thank you. Thank you, John, for these uh, comprehensive comments. I, this is actually uh, leading us to a very rich discussion uh, because you're now talking about uh, competition for prioritization, perhaps sometimes between water and energy, and uh, you emphasized a number of times the, the focus on increasing efficiencies in, in, the, in the two arenas. So we will certainly come back to that and discuss those in more detail. Let's change gears uh, a little bit. Um, our next panelist is Mr. Bushan Taludar. Uh, he's with UN Habitat and is based in Nepal. So perhaps, uh, Bushan, you can take us in the direction of urban water energy nexus. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, as we move from industry to cities, I think it will be appropriate if I take you on a small trip to a few of the cities around the world. Um, I'll start from Kathmandu. That's where I come from and a city that I'm most familiar with. How many of you have been to Kathmandu? Oh, quite a few. It's more than I imagined. <laughs> if you've been to Kathmandu, probably the first thing you'll realize is that there's a water shortage. Well, maybe not if, it's living, if you're going to stay in a five-star hotel. You'll get all the water you want. But for the residents, the water demand is three times the water supply. That's in the dry season. Of course, residents have lived to adapt with this. They take fewer showers, so you may find them dirty at times. I know of friends who just wash the collar of their shirt so that they don't have to wash the whole shirt. But it makes life a little bit difficult. But what makes life more difficult is that Kathmandu also suffers from up to 14 hours of load shedding a day. Now, load shedding means scheduled power cuts. Of course, on top of that, there are unscheduled power cuts. That makes life quite difficult if you want to work in an office or if you want to operate your water pump. As a result, people are waking up 2 in the morning depending on what their load shedding schedule is, to pump water. And the main wastewater treatment plant in Kathmandu doesn't function because 
it can't pay its electricity bill, if it gets electricity at all. And diesel is too expensive. We have to import all our petroleum from India, and operating a diesel set just doesn't cut it. With all that happening, Kathmandu still continues to grow at around 5% a year, one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in South Asia. What's happening? Kathmandu is not unique. This is a scenario that you will see in many developing country cities around the world. We've all heard the figures, urbanization happening, happening rapidly. Half the world lives in cities now. By 2050, that'll be two-thirds. 200,000 people being added to cities every day. That's about one every half a second. All of these are putting increasing demand on water and energy, particularly in, in developing countries where more than 90% of this urbanization is happening. Developing countries will increasingly face problems with water and energy. And cities are having to go further away or deeper down in search of water. And with that, their energy bill goes up, up, and up. Jodhpur, a city in India, gets, it, gets its water from Indira Gandhi Canal, which is 200 kilometers away. It has to pump water from the canal and then transport 200 kilometers. As a result, its electricity bill is about 70% of its total costs. And with increasing modernization, increasing economic growth, the water demand will continue to grow, as we know. But some cities have shown that this growth in water demand, together with economic growth, does not have to be a linear relationship. You can control that growth. New York City, for example, 1980s, its water demand, per capita water demand per day, was around 800 liters per capita per day. After, about, after a couple of decades, they had managed to lower that to 480 liters per capita per day. Singapore is much more efficient. They, there, the demand is only about 300 liters per capita per day. Compare that to Kuala Lumpur, 500, or Guangzhou, both 500 plus liters per capita. Clearly, these cities are showing that you can put the brakes on increasing water demand. But you have to be smart about it. Water demand and energy, as I said earlier, comes together. And a lot of times, this is due to, um, you know, the distance, based on the distance water has to be traveled, or on treatment options. Many cities are also finding that increasingly, you know, relatively clean water is difficult to find. So then you have to go to expensive technologies such as desalination, which we all know is very energy intensive. A desalination of water is about 10 times more energy intensive than most freshwater treatment technologies. And in some places, like Sweden where we are, it's not just the transportation or the treatment, it's the heating. Professor Olson has um, done calculations that show that the cost of heating water is almost 100 times more than the cost of transportation of water, collection and transportation of water here in Sweden. So there are all these challenges facing cities. What do we do? Obviously, it's time to rethink urban development as we know it. With 2.6 billion people being added to urban areas, what we know is a lot of the cities of the future are not there yet. They have yet to be developed, which means there are opportunities to develop cities that are smarter, develop cities that are compact, more efficient, and develop water supply systems or water and energy efficiency, build it into the system that in includes an overall integrated urban water management system. And third, look at the waste. There are plenty of opportunities to generate energy from wastewater or get water itself from wastewater. And there are cities who are doing it. Chennai in India, it sells its wastewater to an industry petroleum company, which then treats it and uses it. For them, it's 
cheaper, obviously, to use the wastewater. Chennai also has mandated that every household, that's 8 million population in Chennai, has to have a rainwater harvesting system. As a result, what they have managed to do is defer um, the, the need to get water from far away and therefore reduce energy costs. Water reuse, Namibia. Okay, it stands out as a country, the most arid country in sub-Saharan Africa, but the capital, city of Windhoek, is using recycled water. Almost 30% of its water is recycled water, and it's been doing it for several decades now. Recycled water is cheaper, more or less energy intensive than many other options, such as desalination. Energy efficiency, we talked about earlier as well in the case of industry, in water supplies, in urban water supply as well. A recent study coming out from World Bank shows 10 to 30 percent um, decrease in energy or due to simple energy efficient measures, which also results and which also has a short payback time, one to five years. All of this is things that cities can do, and a lot of cities are doing it. Sydney, they're using renewable technology. They're using biogas. They're from sewage. They're also taking their sewage outfall, which, which has a, um, between the place it falls and the ocean outlet has a head, using that to generate electricity, as well as solar and wind. And by 2020, they hope to be totally carbon neutral. Come back to Stockholm. I'm sure you've seen the nice blue buses that has biogas written on it. I don't know if you've noticed the biogas written on it, but notice it. I hear there are more than 100 of these in Stockholm, all powered by your shit. Yep, that's the wastewater of Stockholm that goes to generate biogas and the biogas buses. And I hear New Delhi is trying to f follow the footsteps, which is great. Amman, Jordan, three megawatt generated from wastewater outfall. Again, hydropower from wastewater. And Dalian, China, which is using the thermal energy in wastewater. Wastewater is normally a little bit warmer than um, room conditions, especially gray water. And they are, managed to, they are managing to recover heat out of that which makes their system about 30% more efficient than conven conventional systems. So what are all these cities telling us? A, yes, there is a challenge. B, many cities are showing us the way. There are solutions as well. It's not all over the place, but there are cities that have innovated. And these cities, some of them are in the developing world and some of them are in the developed world, both sides, in Africa, in, in China, India, Stockholm here. We just need to identify them, recognize them, scale it up. Let's come back to Kathmandu. The situation isn't all that bad, as I had painted it earlier. We still manage to live. And there are some good innovations there as well. A friend of mine started a company last year. He calls it Smart Pani. Pani means water. In less than a year, the company has installed more than 100 household rainwater treatment systems. I don't see this friend too often these days, he's too busy. In fact, he started a new company now called Smart Urza. Urza means energy. I think this is, he's a smart guy. But there are many such companies that are slowly starting to make their presence felt. Just near Kathmandu is a place called, is a small town called Dhulikel, where the municipality has um, provided a plot of land to a community which the, where the community treats its wastewater. It has a biogas plant and a wastewater treatment plant. And the revenue generated from sowing, selling the biogas is enough to operate the wastewater treatment plant. Of course, the wastewater treatment plant is a, a natural-based constructed wetland type system, which means there's very low cost. But still, overall, the wastewater treatment system is quite efficient because an energy system is built into it. Again, the challenge for Kathmandu is to recognize this, nurture these, and scale this up. The options 
the opportunities are here for us to grasp. Thank you. Thank you Thank you, Bhushan, for yet another very interesting intervention and uh, sharing us uh, with, with us these really uh, remarkable stories of uh, cities around the world. And you can be assured that we'll come back with some equally interesting questions posed to you in our discussion period. Now I move to our final uh, panelist to bring in the UN water perspective. Uh, um, my friend and colleague, uh, Josefina Maestu, who's the director of the UN Water Decade Program for Advocacy and Communication uh, in Zaragoza, Spain. So, Josefina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Adil, and um, thank you very much for putting together this panel, I must say. Very complimentary and very different presentations, and I think it has made it very easy for me to make my presentation now. I think we have seen and we have heard about similarities and differences in both sectors. I think that was really nice. And my, and my presentation is really about how we move forward. You know, not only that there exist these differences and these similarities, but how we can help for these synergies to be realized and for these differences to be somehow coped with. So I'm really going to talk about partnerships. I'm going to talk about cooperation and about partnerships between, sec between both sectors, so a little bit in line to your last encouragement on how we can work together. Um, in the, first of all, I think we need to understand why this cooperation has to take place between the water and energy sectors. Um, and we have heard quite a lot about efficiency. But we think, I think we need to talk also about security and sustainability as the three, as the key reasons for cooperation between the, three, the, the two sectors of activity. Security, well, you know, water is one of the, of the key risks for the business industry and certainly for also for energy. So also we know that um, security is important to attain the MDGs because um, in many countries, in developing countries especially, the fact that people don't have water, they don't have access to water, to some extent is because there is a limitation of energy as well. People may have facilities in their houses, but they don't have water every day in their houses because there is problems with energy. So the energy budget of countries is limiting the access to water and sanitation services. So that's, that's where the water security issues go. In relation to, to efficiency, there are opportunities. We saw that in the industry for, for cleaner production. There are also opportunities in utilities for, for improving functioning, and there are opportunities for improving the um, resource management. We had in Rio Plus 20 a call to, to integrate social and, and environmental aspects in, in water management and recognize the interlinkages between the different sectors. So that's, that's why we have to, to do uh, cooperation and why we have to, to promote cooperation. But in my view, I think uh, we need to go beyond just the analysis of uh, water for energy, energy for water, and we have to think about developing adequate responses, recognizing the trade-offs, as has been said here as well, and maximize the co-benefits. If we are going to move forward, we need to work on that, so look at what they are. Um, there are opportunities uh, looking at the positive side rather than the differences. Uh, the, the, the opportunities for collaboration are related precisely on the interlinkages be between both sectors. And uh, this relates, for example, to policy making and planning. It's true that every domain is planning separately, that they normally have their own, even they don't have the mandates to collaborate, and that's a problem there, but that's an issue for possibilities of, of collaboration. Utilities, they have a lot, if, in spite of the fact that they are different, but they also have quite a lot in common, and they can learn from each other. We heard here how the, the energy utilities perhaps are much more innovative now because of the pricing issues. So there is quite a lot of room for the water utilities to learn also from the energy utilities. The industry, I'm not going to elaborate because you have done that, and perhaps something else that haven't been mentioned is uh, in relation to regulation in both sectors. 
the regulatory environment for both sectors. There are opportunities to provide enabling environments and institutional frameworks that, that help to, to integrate uh, both sectors. Uh, in terms of the realms for partnerships, you know, where we can work together, resource planning is one of them, um, providing basic services of water and energy, uh, investments in infrastructures, that has been a, re a realm for, for collaboration for quite a long time, particularly in multifunctional or multipurpose infrastructures, you know, hydroelectricity. They have been collaborating. We have had collaborating at least in that sector. Um, efficient use and reduction of waste. Efficient utility management, for example, bill collection. Uh, water and energy audits. I think uh, you, you mentioned there was an very much, but I think there's been quite a lot of, of room for, for um, water and energy audits to happen together, and they have been happening together. Of course, technological platforms, that's also a realm for partnership and collaboration and environmental assessments. There are good examples of, of these partnerships. Many of them are happening, and, and they are well established in the U.S., just giving you some, some examples. The Sacramento Alliance for the Conservation of Water and Energy Together, the Southern California Water and Energy Conservation Partnership. I think it looks like it's something that it hasn't been happening, but it has been happening, okay, both at you know, policy and, some, and mostly at, at local and, and utility level. So the, 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 um, the Water and Energy Utilities Partnerships, which I had a little bit of a look of what they, you know, how they have been uh, collaborating in and, and partnering together, they have done so to, to help themselves in marketing, in doing purchases, in demand management, because demand management that has been mentioned here has been something much more developed in the energy sector than in the, in the water sector. So there is, there, 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 was a, a, there is a driver there to, to, to really collaborate. And uh, ideally, uh, this, this water and energy utilities partnerships, when they have worked well, has been when they, they, they have not only included the, the water, and utility, water and energy utilities, but also when they have brought the local authorities, the local SME, SMEs, you know, for, for innovation in technology and, and the NGOs. Uh, some, some initiatives for improving water and energy efficiency, well, I think some of them have been mentioned here. In new homes constructions, there, there are requirements to obtain certificates. Uh, all, the, all the debate about hot water production has been very important in relation to, to energy efficiency. Uh, there are initiatives in commercial build, buildings to, to establish energy and water rating systems. In, in products labeling, there's also some, there has been some important issues. Uh, there is also residential audits and retrofit programs, which have also been initiatives that have to do with improving water and energy efficiency. Uh, what I want to, to have to use my last minutes uh, deal for my presentation is, is related to, to the advantages and disadvantages of, of, of working together and what are the drivers for, for really working together. So moving into action, not only knowing why we have to, to do these actions and where this has happened. I think the, the, the important thing about partnerships is that they are easy to establish. They, they can help fundraising. They can ensure complementary of skills and knowledge are shared. And they can be very cost effective where they have been happening. There are disadvantages that, you know, they are more fragile in terms of that there is no institutional um, um, leverage to, to really work together for the long term. So they may have limited life and, and uh, the, the issue of how, how long they have lived is, is an issue. In relation to drivers, I think the key driver for, for establishing partnerships, what, where they have happened, has been to recognize the benefits for, for both the water and the energy sector to, to work together. So the, the keys to success where they have been working together, these, these two sectors, have been always to get upper management support, to, to keep the staff communicating, to make it attractive, to both of them, and to monitor and establish pilot programs. If you start, you throw yourself into a partnership in both sectors, and you start with a pilot program where you show benefits, this normally um, 
doesn't work. So to move on the issue, to, to make sure that we move into, into helping the, in the Nexus, you know, to, to promote it and to make sure that we improve collaboration, uh, we may need, first of all, to demonstrate the benefits from experience, identify the key stakeholders that you also mentioned, analyze the existing partnerships experiences, and provide platforms for exchange of, of partnerships experience, focusing on how of to making th this partnership work, and that's normally much of it is a management and social issue. And just the last word is that to do that, we, we, we hope to, do, to help him it from UN Water at least in, in two ways. One is that we have this UN Water uh, award that will be given in World Water Day that you mentioned, and it will be on water and energy, and I encourage you to, to nominate some practice for that. And also in January, from the 16th of 19th of January next year, we will have a conference and we will be talking exactly of which partnership have been working, how to make it work, and, and try to move the issue in the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a very nice way to wrap up the panel discussion because now you're uh, pointing us in directions in, in how we can build these partnerships to respond to many of the challenges that we've just heard about. We will be uh, soon going for a, a coffee break, but let me just uh, describe the process for the rest of this seminar. We will be going into an interactive session where we will uh, li like to engage you quite directly into the dialogue uh, and uh, with the panelists uh, and, and with the wealth of wisdom that we have, we hope that there will be a very uh, interesting discussion. Thanks to all the panelists in terms of keeping to the time very well. We're only a couple of minutes behind our schedule. Before we break for coffee, there's one other important piece of information that we would like to share with you, and that's a, as I mentioned in the beginning, a teaser from the World Water Development Report, and I'm very pleased to invite uh, Rick Connor from the World Water Assessment Program uh, to share that with us. Rick, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Hi, ladies and gentlemen. Um, is the point set up? No, okay. Uh, just while this is getting done, uh, for some of you might not know, the, the first four uh, World Water Development Reports um, were triannual and were released during the World Water Forums. And uh, this has changed. And starting in 2014, the reports are going to be released on an annual basis. These will be much shorter and thematic. And so the first thematic report uh, due on Water Day in 2014 is on water and energy. So I'm just going to quickly go over like, the more or less the structure and to show you what you can, what you can expect uh, in the next report and uh, maybe with a few highlights. So the first chapter is just setting the stage and it has a lot to do with what Torgny was talking about. Um, describing, you know, the essential, the challenges, the um, differences and similarities between water and energy. Energy is, for instance, energy is big business. The global energy market is estimate and, uh, estimated annually at $6 trillion. This completely dwarfs anything uh, water-related in the water services industries. And because of this, water tends to have a much greater potential uh, political attention. And so remain, whereas water remains perceived more as a social or environmental issue at the political level. The next chapter focuses on water. It is the World Water Development Report, and so we report on new emerging trends, um, trends related to water availability, the energy, and we report on the energy required to provide water services. Here's, um, this, was, this came out in uh, Nature last year, and so we also try to populate the World Water Development with re Report with new findings uh, that come out, and this, is, this was from Nature and it's showing that the, there's more and more evidence on incre increased stress on groundwater. Chapter 3 will focuses on different types of energy, their demands for and impacts on water, and how these are likely to evolve over the next two decades. There's no escaping it. According to the IEA, global energy demand is expected to increase by one-third uh, by 2035. 
And energy currently accounts for 15% of all fresh water withdrawals. Now, this is not something that's usually reported. Usually what you get is, the, you know, and I'm sure most of you know this, a 70% ag, 10% uh, domestic or municipal water, and 20% industry. But this 20% industry, 75% of it is for energy. So we might want to think about this a little bit diff differently, and this is one of the one of these slow, stepwise uh, things that we're going that we're trying to accomplish with this report. Now, note that the scale on the x-axis is logarithmic. So again, there's no escaping it. Water withdrawals for energy are estimated to increase by 20 percent by 2035, but energy water consumption is expected to uh, increase by 85 percent over that same period. And we'll get into that a little, but that just has to do with how you, you water is used to produce energy. Although energy demand is expected to increase uh, by one third, electric power generation is expected to increase by 70%. This has a monumental implications for water. From a global perspective, the fact that certain renewables, wind, solar PV, uh, may not require much water is actually, it's great, but it's of little consequence if you're looking at the big picture. Although, of course, these, these along the, with other renewables like geothermal can have significant local implications uh, and impacts on water demand. But the bottom line is thermal power is going to continue to dominate. Again, the x-axis is logarithmic. So from a water point of view, the water requirements for cooling for thermal power depend on the cooling technology, of course, open loop, closed loop, dry cooling. But there's a major question of where do you want, do you want to use water in terms of withdrawals for open loop cooling, or do you want to use less water but consume it all for closed loop cooling? So it's not, it, 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 the, there's no one solution. It really depends on your water availability and other demands in the same area. But these decisions will have to be made if you're going to reach the increase, uh, the, meet the increased electricity demand. Uh, we, I know you can't read through this. This is just, two, we have 29 uh, a, data, uh, a data annex with 29 global, in, global statistics uh, related to water and energy. And this we will continue doing with the annual reports that are thematic and we'll also be putting together a database for each theme. Uh, part two of the report uh, is done by five lead agencies that are partners, uh, UN Water Partners looking at more of a specific theme or sub-theme along water and energy. So we have the World Bank uh, looking at um, infrastructure and financing, giving specific examples of ways that water and energy infrastructure can be combined to yield positive economic and social benefits through coordinated technical approaches. Uh, FAO took the lead on a chapter focusing on the important water, energy, food nexus related aspects. Uh, UN Habitat and Bhushan gave a nice outline and summary of what's to, what can be expected in the, um, in the UN Habitat uh, uh, chapter on, uh, on cities and urban, uh, under, in the context of accelerating urbanization. And John gave a good uh, summary of what to be expected in UNIDO's chapter um, that focuses on manufacturing and the roles and responsibilities of private sector companies. And finally, our friends at UNEP put together a, uh, they led a thematic section that concludes the thematic part of the report and on ecosystems. Part three of the report examines specific issues relevant to different regions. Led by the five U, uh, UN regional economic commissions, each one of the short chapters examines the most pertinent water-related uh, issues and challenges, but from that regional perspective. And the last part, chapter, part four, the concluding chapters, uh, the first, chapter 15, describes you know, more of a broad range of approaches and responses from policy, cultural, and economic perspectives. It's the idea of like, what you need to create an enabling environment for change and to accelerate progress. The, the next chapter provides 
Many examples of actions being carried out by water and energy users, businesses, local governments, and other organizations who are actually implementing change, creating synergies along the lines indicated in the, throughout the report. And the report uh, concludes with, uh, with a look at the role of the United Nations and the international community, the role they can play in formulating responses to energy and water challenges. My last slide, I know, I know we're pressed for time and everybody wants coffee. So I won't get into the big detail on this, but I just want to make, let you know that these issues are covered in as, uh, how do I say, in the most open uh, and transparent way possible. So we're not saying fracking's good, fracking's bad. We're saying this is, how, how, this is what fracking does, and this is what it's been shown to do. And it's still up to, up to decision makers to, uh, to decide and to regulate. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Rick, and uh, you will, of course, be joining us in the panel as we continue after the coffee break. I know we've heard uh, some very interesting thoughts and ideas, and I'm sure you have dozens of questions that we need to uh, deal with, and um, we're very much excited and looking forward to that uh, session. So we will have a 30-minute coffee break, and we will reconvene at quarter past four, at 4.15, back here uh, sharp, so look forward to uh, seeing you back. Thank you very much again.
Hallå, hallå. Ska jag bara se.
Well, thank you very much for coming back. Please have a seat and we will start in a moment. So now we come to the really interesting and exciting part of the program where you, the audience, get to quiz our panelists. Uh, before we get to that, uh, there's a few questions that I would like to use uh, just to warm them up a little bit to the questions uh, which I'm sure will come from you. Let's start with uh, looking at the question of efficiency around the, the energy sector, the water sector, and the, um, the industrial side of things. And I'll, I'll go in sort of uh, random order. Uh, John, you spoke about uh, how industries really need to bring out a greater level of efficiency. And you would think that that's something that makes good logical sense. And all the industries and industrial sectors should be automatically doing that. But we know, in fact, that that is not universally true. And the question is, what really are the roadblocks to industries in going in that direction? Are they hampered by regulations? Are they hampered by competition? What is it? I think it's... It's a little bit of everything, really, but a, a lot of what I, th what I feel is that they, they have so many other priorities driving their bottom lines. As I mentioned, they're, they're looking at labor, labor availability, markets where the products are made and sold. And these, for them, are often much more significant drivers financially than, than getting hold of water and energy that they, may, they need. I think water and energy becomes a problem when they're in areas of scarcity or, or, or poor distribution of power, for example, or something like that. But they would preferentially locate to go for markets and, and labor and that sort of thing ahead of, of, of water and energy in many cases because um, that's, that's a bigger driver for them and more important in many ways. Even now, centers of innovation, a lot of industries uh, are targeting those and dealing with the other issues behind that, that sort of thing. So um, we see a, a lot of um, uh, different factors pulling them in different directions. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. And of course, we talked about also the asymmetries between water and energy, and uh, uh, Torgny highlighted that uh, quite well. And, and the question is that are there also uh, asymmetries in the knowledge which is available to the two sectors? Are there gaps? And are there ways in which we can address the gap? And if you can catch my drift, what I'm leading to is how does the World Water Week next week try to address some of those gaps uh, which there would be? So if you can identify what the gaps are, if there are any, and how would, how would we go about ad addressing those? Uh, yes, I believe there are, there are gaps in our understanding and knowledge, not only maybe in the, in the, in the water community, but also to reaching out to address the water issues, which is quite um, important uh, uh, for other sectors. And I th our aim for next World Water Week is to bring in energy sector people to come to discuss with us, because I think uh, energy, to my mind, is, uh, well, uh, it's not far ahead, but they are ahead of, of water when it comes to this efficiency and also knowledge on, on to utilize the scarce resource, which is it, it is. So our aim is to broaden the knowledge scope and also bring it over and, and maybe bridge the knowledge gap in between the water community or the water sector and the energy sector. I think that is the first step in that direction. Okay, thank you very much. You also talked about another type of gap, which are capacity gaps. And these are capacity gaps uh, within water and within energy, and there's also a capacity gap between water and energy. Uh, and Ingvar, you spoke about uh, capacity building as a sort of a crucial building block of how we start to address the challenges. How do we go about addressing those, uh, those capacity needs? You shared some interesting models of how you train individuals, but you also need institutions on the other side to retain these individuals and to actually make use of their, uh, their capacity. So how do we go about doing that? Well, this is, this is very correct. You, you, it is sometimes even more important to train uh, people at the, at the top of the institutions, make them understand the need for this. And this has taken some time in, in several years in different parts of the world. But uh, what is so good is once they see the light, 
uh, then they will pick out their best young people, men and women, and uh, nominate them for training, and uh, also for the people, for the young scientists and engineers who are starting to work with, with uh, companies in various uh, countries. This is also a challenge to them to, to see if they will be selected. So, so what in a way, we are, we are taking the cream off, so to speak. Sure. And, uh, and uh, similarly, we always start the training program uh, for each continent, or we have only, only basically done this mostly only for, for Africa and, and uh, Latin America. And then we have a, a workshop for decision makers, where we have heads of geological surveys, often permanent secretaries from energy ministries and, and so on, and uh, several people from each of the countries in the area and uh, go through the process that is needed in geothermal development. We held this also in China for Asian countries. There we go in a different way because they are dealing with warm water for, for space heating and, and, and cooling, but the others are with high temperature. And with, with these courses, which are for laymen, basically, but uh, to explain to the top people in, uh, in the ministries and with the companies uh, what is involved, then they understand better when these young people come back home filled with enthusiasm and mention all kinds of numbers and how many they need to employ, uh, what equipment they need, and especially what it costs to drill a, 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 the first research well. Their mind is much more open, so I think you have to look at this, look at the whole spectrum, and there is no need to go straight just for the training. You have to also build up the, 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 the knowledge uh, and uh, the, the visibility for the decision makers in the countries of what you're doing. I am sure that this applies also to, to potable water and, and, and so on. So if I understand you correctly, it's a combination of government response and the private sector response that can help build the institutional hosting space for these yes. brilliant people who go back to yes. their countries. Indeed. Well, thank you. We were, as Leila, we're talking about the, the gaps. And you pointed out uh, some gaps in the, in the energy sector, and particularly in the East African uh, context. Uh, we heard that uh, hydropower capacity is not fully utilized, uh, and, and we know those numbers uh, are often mentioned. But the question is that there is also efficiency gaps uh, in the energy sector. How do we go about minimizing those? And, and as we've heard, uh, uh, back here in uh, 2011, the Stockholm Statement talked about producing more kilowatts per drop of water. So how do we address this, this gap uh, in, in energy generation efficiency that will already yield us some, some immediate uh, dividends? Thank you. Uh, <coughs> uh, thank you for these uh, questions. Yes, uh, I totally agree that there are already efficiency gaps in the Eastern Africa power pool members, power systems in the overall systems, not only for the hydro or powers, but there are a number of measures being undertaken to improve this efficiency. But now the main issue is the expansion of the, the system given the vast uh, amount of hydro generation potential in the region. So uh, that's why I, uh, I raised the level of access is very minimal. The available hydro potential could be developed with, and could, ye, could provide at least to cost power, which is uh, desperately needed for access expansion. Um, so there are uh, already efficiency measures being taken at the national levels to improve the efficiency of the existing facilities, but the major issue is the expansion of the new hydro facilities. Great. Well, thank you very much. That, that's, that's helpful to see that there's uh, already some, some positive change which is coming about. Speaking of change, uh, 
Bush and you talked about a lot of innovations uh, in cities and, and some very interesting examples. What you didn't uh, get into so much was how, how does that type of innovation get resourced? Is it uh, coming from energy sector, water sector? Is government bringing in money? Are there outside donors who are empowering uh, through bringing in resources? What's, what's the key to bringing about innovation at the urban level? Um, direct answer, I don't know. Where, are the, where is the resource coming from? Because it's difficult yeah, to see that if you, a lot of examples that are what I've said is coming from the water industry, yes, the, the Chennai Water Board or the, uh, the you know Sydney Sydney Water and so on. I assume that it's the water companies themselves or the water board, in, in, and if it's a government agency, the municipality, or so um, putting in the money. What we don't see so far, and of course it, to operate it, then there is the the customers, the the clients who are footing the bill as well. What we don't see so far is not much um, financing on the innovation side from major um, development partners and so on. Um, one example would be just um, as an example, and this is, for example, in, in, in Nepal, in, in Kathmandu. Right? There's, a, there's a big project underway to bring water into Kathmandu Valley from the next valley, which is 28 kilometers away. Um, several people had raised the issue of, well, you could combine that with a hydropower plant. Uh, Kathmandu is, is, is located at an elevation, you're bringing water from further away and at an elevation, so a hydropower plant there, plus a hydropower plant downstream to, you know, to get that wastewater as well, and you could generate as much as 250 megawatts um, out of there, which is great. And these megawatts are being generated at very close to, at, to the point of use, so the transmission losses are um, reduced significantly. But um, that was never taken up seriously. Uh, one problem was that, again, people thinking in silos and, and you know, the, the energy people are totally different from the water people and, and, and people don't want to make things more complex than, than they um, actually are. So I think in the, in, in the innovation side, it's coming from the water utilities themselves, trying to um, reduce their costs, looking at ways how, how they could um, um, make the systems more efficient and so on. Okay, thank you. Rick, you talked about uh, sort of a global analysis and a regional analysis. So I'll, I can maybe pose a very similar question because uh, you've looked at the, the sort of the big picture uh, in terms of the water energy nexus. Um, is there enough investment going into into it? And if not, are there ways for changing that, that equation uh, to actually, and I'm not talking about separate investment into energy and separate investment into water, which we know is happening. Where's the investment coming in into where the two combine? Um, good question. Is this on? Good question. Uh, there's no, I don't know, I think any government, uh, whether it's uh, provincial or federal, national, has a budget line for water and energy. So if you're talking about public investment, there's, it's, it would come from project by, on a project by project basis. So you're, lo you're looking at possibilities for coexistence or you know, coordinated um, a plant, for instance, that are both power plants and desal plants. Or because the power plant, if it's a thermal plant, then you can use uh, open loop and then you're heating water, and then you use that extra heat for the water to facilitate the, um, uh, the, 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 you can use that heat to facilitate the evaporation process or the osmosis process for your desal. There's uh, other coupled projects. Uh, we talked about uh, the, the biogas, for instance, from, um, from wastewater. I think I, I agree that it's probably led mainly by the water domain, the water sector. Let's call it the water services sector, because we, uh, at least with WAP, we've been, in the last few reports, we've been trying to differentiate the fact that water, energy is a sector, agriculture is a sector, water has a sector, the water, you know, water services, mm -hmm. but it's also a resource, and sometimes you're managing and you're, sometimes you're managing water resources, sometimes you're managing for water services. And so when you're talking about the water energy nexus, this kind of gets, it gets lost. Is, are you talking about water 
as the, ser uh, the service provision, or are you talking about water as a resource required for energy? And these are different. So mm -hmm. get, you know, the reason I'm getting into this detail is because if you're asking for a project by project basis, then you're not talking about water resources management, you are talking about water services management. Okay, thank you very much. That's, that's a very sort of a nuanced description of what, what happens at the, at the ground level, and that means that complexity may or may not be reflected at the planning levels. Uh, Josefina, you talked about uh, bringing together partnerships to address uh, some of these, these gaps that we've now heard about. Uh, and, and I think you talked about some very interesting mechanisms for generating partnerships. What I would like to uh, pin you is on, uh, can you share with us some examples of what partnerships are, are there uh, which are actually working and working well? Yes. Um, when, when I give you a little bit of the overview of what has been going on out there, I think one has to recognize that there has been more collaboration on, on the utility level and the industrial level. Uh, especially when the industries are talking about uh, you know, improving efficiencies in the supply chain. Because inside the companies, there is an interest of improving water and industry, sorry, water and energy efficiency. But, but when you're talking about partnerships, then you have to partner with, with uh, others outside of your own company. So that would be talking about the supply chain. In relation to, to the utilities, that's where I think there has been more, more um, uh, examples of, of collaboration and particularly in, in those areas where there are opportunities for, for cost savings and, and for, for um, uh, improving benefits. The, the, I think what you, you were also asking the question before, and I will come back to your question as well, is the, in relation to how you finance that. In, in, the, in the examples that I have been reviewing, um, the, that, that's really is internal to the company. But the idea that you collaborate because there are incentives, but the incentives in the utilities, both in the uh, collaboration between energy and, and water utilities, is because they can save co cost by the collaboration. They can either provide, they can do joint marketing campaigns, for example. They can do joint billing, so that will help them both. They can they can help each other to do purchase purchases because a lot of the times, as, as it was said before, is that there are um, uh, public companies have more difficulties in, in some kind of purchases. So that if you if you enjoy if you join a partnership, that may make it easier for the public sector providers. So is that that's the kind of examples we are talking about? Okay, perfect, good. The audience has been waiting quite patiently, so let me open up the floor uh, for any questions. Uh, please introduce yourself, your name and your organizational affiliation, and uh, if you're directing it to one of the panelists, please identify them, otherwise we'll ask uh, the panelists to, combined, uh, to give a combined answer. And we'll take three or four questions and then take it back to the, uh, to the panelists. So, sir, you uh, in, in the backs. Thank you very much. Uh, Brian Matthew. Um, first of all, I'd like to say how pleased I am to see that the water energy nexus is the theme for, uh, for next year's World Water Day. Um, I would like to put in a plea, though, uh, and that is one of the things that seems to be missing um, and I would love to see included, and that is uh, tidal energy uh, as well as the other forms of energy. Um, I'm working with uh, a project uh, called The Reef. Uh, at the moment, this is purely at a conceptual level, but the potential, uh, Rolls-Royce and W.S. Atkins have done an appraisal of it, um, and they reckon it would, could generate from one uh, river estuary alone in the UK, admittedly a large one, known as the Bristol Channel, something in the region of 30 terawatts, or about 12% of Britain's current energy generating um, so so the potential elsewhere in the world of course for this could be vast and it's uh, something else to put into the mix and of course it is very much water energy based thank you thank you very much that's a very interesting question and if i unpack it it, it contains elements of innovation how you find the technologies it contains elements of financing, how you find the resources, and it also has elements of regulation and how do you make sure that there are no environmental impacts from insulation. So it's a, it's a fairly loaded question. 
Yes, Daniel. My name is Daniel Segai. I come from the UN Water Decade Program on Capacity Development, based in Bonn, Germany. My personal feeling is that wastewater was not emphasized enough, its contribution for energy. The huge potential of wastewater contain, con that contains energy, it just by far exceeds uh, what the energy, the kind of energy that we use to treat wastewater. If I were to quote Water Environment Research Foundation, they say it says 10 times, it exceeds 10 times uh, than the energy that is used to treat wastewater. The other thing is wastewater also contains valuable uh, materials or ma valuable nutrients, fertilizers, and uh, if we were to use this fertilizer, then we can also save energy that is uh, used to, to produce these chemical fertilizers. And when water is scarce, the uh, available option is to treat uh, wastewater because if you have to pump groundwater or if you have to transport, like what Bushan said, 200 kilometers to transport water, the energy that is used is also by far exceeds. So uh, what I wanted to say is that investing on wastewater is energy saving. And I can give you one uh, example that uh, we I'm working on, that safe use of wastewater in agriculture, that is a kind of a multilateral initiative that is done with, together with UNU, INVE, FAO, w, uh, um, FAO, WHO, and others. And we, what we do is we just try to promote safe use of wastewater in agriculture. We do capacity development regional workshops. So my question is, do you share my viewpoint, one, and how can we untap and explore this potential of wastewater? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, one more question here. Yeah. Yeah, I have, uh, I have two questions, if you don't mind. My name is Bert Deporn from UN Habitat. Um, I live in, um, in Nairobi, so I was very uh, interested in the story about your East African grid and your electricity and so Mr. Zedalim Gabriot. And of course I know, I, I know the Rift Valley, so I know there's a good potential in for, uh, for thermal energy. But then you're talking about the big potential of hydropower and, and you see it from an electricity point of view, but at the end of the day, this is a water issue and the issue is not how to connect this country with electricity, the issue is how do you get agreement and you have seen the articles in the newspaper when uh, Ethiopia started diverting water and how the government of Egypt reacted, okay now that person uh, is no longer there uh, but okay I think that that is so at the end of the, the day your solution for for East Africa for and relying on, on, on hydropower, you first have to, to, to get your water act together and, and have the, the countries agree upon a shared river. So I would like to see your reaction on that one. Uh, secondly, Mr. Togni, um, okay, this year you uh, celebrated 3,000 participants. For next year, do you, what, what are your plans? Because your ambition should be to have 3,000 water experts and 3,000 energy experts, so that we really have a water and energy conference. So what are your plans to do that? Thank you for that challenge. Uh, we'll take one more question and uh, uh, bring it back to, uh, to the panelists. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, my name is Wei Yu, and I'm from WWF China. And my question is very short. And um, nowadays, the Nexus, the word Nexus, is very popular. All we can see it is very fashion now. And uh, my question is, could you give me, could, could you give us some uh, definitions, clearly definitions about the Nexus, especially for the water energy Nexus? Thanks very much. Okay, thank you. Let me bring it back. Who would like to start? There's a series of very interesting questions. Yes, uh, Ingvar and then Bushan. Yes, the, the wastewater, it's, it's a very important issue. But I, I think my, my brain is getting older day by day. But I think I remember correctly that Sweden was the first country to start uh, putting heat pumps or taking, taking wastewater and get this through heat pumps and use it for district heating. Uh, I think actually we are in the, in the Bethlehem of, of, uh, of wastewater, heat extraction from wastewater here in Stockholm. But my Swedish colleagues, they, they will correct me. But this is very, very important. And for instance, in, in uh, the capital of Iceland, uh, Reykjavik, uh, we have until recently been uh, uh, 
putting into the, out into the sea uh, water that has already gone through radiators in, in, in the houses. And uh, this water has been uh, in certain parts between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius, so it is much hotter, much warmer than the water that people are drilling for down to two or three kilometers in some European, uh, European uh, cities. And, and obviously, we are wasting a lot of energy in this way, but gradually we are, we are extracting more and more energy out of the water before we dispose of it. But this is, a, this is an enormous, an enormous uh, amount of energy that is going with the wastewater. Okay, thank you. Boshan. Um, yeah, back, to, I guess, wastewater is more um, a city's issue. So yes, um, answer to your first question, yes, I do share your um, views, and I agree with you that wastewater is an important issue, particularly if you think that um, right now, you know, 90% of the wastewater generated in developing countries is not treated. So, um, and we're talking about uh, post-2015 goals, which includes wastewater. Um, so, um, naturally, there'll be a lot of interest in wastewater management and so on. And in that context, um, instead of just wastewater treatment, if we think about wastewater um, generating energy and recycling wastewater for um, reuse and so on, that would be in our best interest. And I think there is some there's a lot of thought going into that as well. And um, I also alluded in, in my uh, presentation a little bit on, on the different ways that it's being done. You, you talked about, um, definitely, we just talked a little bit earlier on the thermal energy on wastewater. And not just the wastewater, but um, there was another session here earlier, earlier this week on um, sludge. Yeah? And, and, and the sludge has a heat value, which is uh, better than some of the fuels that is being used. And, and they're, they're using this in you know, Uganda and some other African countries as well. Um, so besides the, th then there's, the, so the, there's the thermal energy that can be used, there's a the potential energy that we talked about in Amman, and that, that they're already in generating three megawatts, and then of course the chemical bound energy as biogas, which um, again, Stockholm is a great example of it. Um, so there are different ways and we should explore it further. What um, is the bottleneck, I would say, in many cases, it's the knowledge. I mean, the water utilities, um, the engineers there, the, the managers there specialize in, um, they've learned about providing water, but wastewater management is something more new, and especially wastewater re reuse. Thanks. I can add one more uh, to your list, uh, which is that for wastewater in water-scarce countries, when you're pumping out water from a very deep aquifer, the energy costs are quite high. And when you use wastewater for irrigation, you actually offset that cost also. And this is something that, that was uh, explored in this initiative as well. Zlelam, there was a question posed to you quite directly about yeah. hydropower and water management. Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, maybe I'm not clear uh, when I say there is a vast hydropower potential in the region. Um, the issues related to this, the cooperative framework agreement of the, on the Nile Basin are related to only on the hydro projects on the Nile. But, for example, talking about the Blue Nile itself, that represents only one of the 12 river basins in Ethiopia only. If we see the entire Eastern Africa region, there is also the Congo River Basin and other resources. So the, the entire uh, Blue Nile Basin may represent only less than 15% of the total hydro potential we are talking about in the Eastern Africa region. At the same time, when I say in the order of 180,000 megawatts, that includes also geothermal uh, power. And there are many hydropower projects under development in Ethiopia. On the Blue Nile, only one is on the Blue Nile at this time. There are four or five hydropower sites, like the Gibesri, which is 2,000 megawatt close to 2,000 megawatt capacity, Ganale, et cetera. So without, the, without signing that cooperative agreement, we can still have uh, an option to develop uh, in the order of tens of thousands of megawatt without including the, hydro, the geothermal. Thank you. So not to put words in your mouth, but are you suggesting that the cooperative framework on Nile somehow offers a roadblock to full exploitation of the hydropower potential? Now, at this stage, even without uh, the, that cooperative framework agreement, there is a hydropower development on the Blue Nile, which is a 6,000 megawatt project. But 
if that cooperative agreement is signed now, that would facilitate the development of many other projects. Okay. But without, uh, uh, there are many other sites outside the Nile Basin in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, so the agreement, uh, without the agreement, even we can do a lot of uh, okay. development with regards to hydro. Okay. Thank you. Torgny, there was a very pointed question uh, at you. <coughs> Uh, let me address the question about should there be 6,000 participants next year? Uh, well, <laughs> may, may, maybe, maybe, maybe we need two weeks. Uh, well, if I make some um, easy uh, calculation of maths here, 60% uh, of you will come back next year. We know that at the start of the week. That is what we have been uh, repeat um, um, uh, registrations over the last few years. So 60% will be. Uh, repeat uh, guests. So that leaves us with 40% uh, maybe new. And if we can attract, and that is our aim, also with the uh, energy focus next year also, uh, uh, count of, oh well, uh, people and from the, from the energy sector, let's say maybe easy math, that would be 1,000. So uh, maybe uh, if we could increase a bit, but it should not be uh, grow that big, I think still the value of World Water Week is that you can be assured that you will meet colleagues from different parts, different actors, different sectors from all over the world to have this informal discussion and also learn from each other. So yes, uh, we will attract. And secondly, I, I planning also now that we will not only have a one year event on water and energy, but that will also be kept for years to come. So we can, uh, I think that will also be some kind of triggering to attract people from outside the water community that they can come back and also learn from a more long-term partnership uh, building. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Josefina, you had your hand up, uh, but let me also add uh, something uh, in your direction in terms of the definition of nexus, because that's uh, something quite important for generating partnerships. If you can't define what the nexus is or how it's important, uh, how can we trigger partnerships? So. Yeah. Uh, Maybe this, this, the second part is a little bit more difficult, but the definition, maybe we can deal with that. I can imagine that, that uh, the, the motive for that question is that we, we feel that when we are talking about Nexus, we are leaving out ecosystems and environmental issues, so that we are focusing mainly on, on production and mainly on the productive sectors, and, and that has been something that has been raised over and over again. But I think, um, you know, at the beginning of my presentation, I, I you know, I thought that it would be important to, to map out that the objectives of partnerships have to do with efficiency, security, and sustainability. And, and the issues of sustainability are very important when you're talking about the trade-offs between water and the energy sector, all the issues about production of hydroelectricity, uh, improving regulation for, for energy production, etc. Um, all this can have positive and ne negative effects on resilience. And so looking at the trade-offs between water and energy from an environmental perspective is also part of the, of the issues we have to look at when we are looking at the, at the interrelationship between water and energy. So the second part about how you make this operational in terms of partnerships, I don't think, one of the things that maybe I didn't say when I answered your previous question is that it seems to me that there is a ladder of partnerships and the ladder of partnerships have been seen to be easier in the utility and industrial sector, but this is not being so much in the planning, programming and policy making. And that's where I can see the answer to your question now, okay? Thank you. John, did you have a no, response? Not really. I, I did comment or two on all of them. I, I didn't feel anybody had addressed this gentleman's question about tidal power. And while I'm not an, an expert on that, it did, maybe I can fire a question back in a way. It seemed to me that 30 terawatts was a huge amount of power. And I have a little bit of knowledge about what goes on in Canada where I live. And they've been trying to do this on the Bay of Funday for a while with these very high tides there. And I don't think I've met with too much success. And so I wondered why you thought perhaps you could get 30 terawatts out of the Bristol Channel, which I do know a little bit about too. And how do you transmit that power? Where's the T and D come in to that equation? <laughs> Briefly, if you will, please. Be as, as quick as I can. The, um, the, the generation system called the reef uh, came out of the earlier stuff on the, uh, the seven barrage. Um, which had various problems, one of which was, of course, you hold the tide back, you generate a great big uh, peak of energy at one stage during the tidal cycle. Could be in the middle of the night, and then what do you do with all that energy? It's such a lot. Mm -hmm. um, 
the idea of the reef came from the environmental side and the environmental problems from the barrage. Um, and the idea was that you generate throughout the tidal cycle. So as the tide flows in and as it flows back out again. Okay. Uh, at both ends, you've actually got hooks up to the national grid because we would like to see it not Cardiff to Western, but further out um, between Aberthaw and Minehead. Aberthaw, there is a conventional um, power station. Minehead is very close to Hinkley Point. Mm -hmm. So there are potential hookups to the national grid. And because you're talking about base load, it, that shouldn't actually be a problem. Okay, so it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, no, so it's, uh, yeah I, I, I think it sort of it conserves water very nicely, doesn't it? <laughs> I think you've got a good point. But I think along, along with a lot of the other alternative sources of energy at the moment, if you could develop 30 terawatts, then, then you, you're overcoming that problem that, that um, wind power and solar power can't generate enough. Um, if you can do that, you've, you've certainly got something going. Okay. On, a, on another point, uh, um, I was thinking about the wastewater and energy that this other gentleman was asking about. I, I, th I don't think anybody would disagree about coming up with all of those good things you can do with, with wastewater, and I think it's going on in the developed world. I think it's in the developing world that's the problem where we need to, to get these technologies out there. And I think there's sort of two angles to this, because in the, in the developed world, our world here, we're having to spend probably a lot of money to retrofit older infrastructure to do this. Whereas in the developing world, if you can get the funding, you have, you have the opportunity to build it from scratch and do it very efficiently. So it was just a point I, I, I thought might be worth making. And the other point on the, the hydro power in, in Africa, I was thinking about transboundary hydro um, and issues, transboundary power issues. And I think there's some good examples uh, of resolutions for these sorts of things going on in the Mekong right now. Or, or there's a big problem there they're trying to resolve. And also in Tajikistan, I think they're having a, a debate with, is it Uzbekistan next door, about one supplying the power, one, one supplying the water for agriculture, and they're trying to trade them off. And I think there are always sort of good examples of this that can be looked at worldwide and brought back to, to other areas. Mm -hmm. Because we, all, we should remember that hydro is not nowadays just about power, it's about dual purpose, because it's reservoirs as well. It's about water supply as much as anything. And I think we need to build that into the, um, into the equation. So just some, some thoughts on that. Okay, thank you very much. Rick, you also had some points. I'll just try to, I think I can touch on two, uh, uh, two questions with one statement. But going back to the issues of knowledge gaps, the issues of differences between the water and energy domains, one that we didn't mention is um, the speed of knowledge development, uh, the speed of innovation, which tends to be a lot quicker in the, uh, in the uh, energy field. Now, with a caveat that is often has to do with the private sector research uh, private sector funded r and d which you don't get in water and you don't get in things like tidal because then there's an ownership um, there's the ownership aspect so you'd need to have some sort of government authority or um, I'm looking for the word but like hydro Quebec is a uh, you know a state operated system and these tend to not just it's just the nature of the beast they tend to not be as innovative and forward-looking than your larger energy companies that are part of the market okay very interesting um, and, and we will Come back, uh, Bush, and you had another. No, she had a question on, on the energy, water energy oh. nexus definition. Maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wanted to. Uh, just the, ne the nexus, and I agree, it's thrown out. Every, every few years, uh, new words come up, and then they get bo we get bored with them and think of something else. But the nexus, really, it, it, the definition, it, it, you know what a Venn diagram is, you know, from grade two? Well, the nexus is the, interse it's, it's the intersection. So it's where, where, to, the, where you, how do you define commonality? between two systems. So okay. if you have a larger Venn diagram, then you can, the nexus will be all, where all three bubbles connect, and then you can go on to many dimensions. Right. Fundamentally, that's what it means. Thank you. And, and we kind of know from the description uh, that, that we got about the asymmetries that Torgny was talking about. That means that the two bubbles of the Venn diagram are likely of very different sizes, yeah. and, and the overlap uh, may be skewed in one way or another. Let's go through another round of questions. I had a hand in the back. Yes. In the, in the very back, please. Okay. 
Hi, is this, I'm Silvio Pereira from the Technical University of Denmark, and I just submitted my dissertation on a modeling framework for water and energy systems. And I found some of the challenges that Mr. Holmgren uh, mentioned, namely the differences in spatial scale and management between these two systems. So actually modeling, modeling them jointly is a very complicated task. And I was wondering if, uh, the, for those of you at the UN system, if they thought that uh, valuation and pricing of water was a good mechanism for tackling this, uh, the negative interlinkages between water and energy systems. And if so, um, what are you doing and what are you, you planning to do on trying to move these mechanisms forward? Okay, thank you, very interesting. Uh, one more question here. My name is Indika uh, from CapNet. Uh, my question is, when I uh, listen to the, the, uh, the definition uh, of nexus, the, the question comes to my mind is, is, is it not the, the same as the integrated water resources management we were talking about? And uh, is there any difference? Uh, because we can, we can t uh, tell uh, any uh, uh, two sectors, which two or three sectors, which has commonalities, uh, we can uh, say as a nexus, like uh, water, energy, and food nexus. So I, I think it's the same as the integrated water resource management. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that interesting question, and we'll come back to that. There's a question at this end. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm actually uh, Rasul Mikkelsen from Gronfos. I'm actually one of these few from the private sector. I think is one of the big problems for this water week as actually uh, the private sector is lacking. Um, I will come back on this one. Um, it seems we have, we have a lot of data. We have a lot of analysis, evaluation, what is the problem when what is, comes to solutions, then we don't have so much data on what is the solution. We, we think there is a lot of solution out there, but how we can scale these solutions, especially in the rural areas. While well, electrification of Africa is reach the cities, not the rural. It will be very difficult if we can imagine in 2030 the whole rural Africa has electricity. And then renewable energy comes to the picture. None of you guys mentioned, for example, solar, especially in Africa. Uh, the, the beauty of solar and how we can adopt the solar and mm. use the solar for the Africa, electrification, water, whatever. Um, comes back to the next week, or next year's uh, water week, I will strongly recommend it, that we not discuss the data, we discuss the solutions. I think because we, we I mean, my whole, my heart and respect for the academia, it seems we have a lot of data, but we don't know how we're going to use this data. So with the next year, I think we sh you should, uh, Mr. Holmgren, put three agenda and say, well, we gather academia, we gather NGOs, we gather UN, we gather multilateral, bilateral, to sit together three days and come with some suggestion how we're going to solve these problems. Otherwise, on 2030, we have a struggle in the same problems. Okay, thank you. Is there another question? Yes. Christian from King's College London. Um, I had a question with regards to the um, role and practices um, of private firms um, and how it fits into the Nexus. Um, in this globalized world, um, one of the major issues is from uh, profit-driven approaches used by many of these private firms, um, often at the expense of the environment or efficiency. Um, how do you ensure the responsible action of these private firms and how does it link into the Nexus? Okay, thank you very much. So another set of very interesting questions. Who would like to go first? Torgny? Uh, I, can, I can start. <coughs> On uh, next year, yeah, I totally agree with you that uh, private sector should be here and also go for solutions. And what we have seen over the last few years is that it has increased uh, interest from private sector. I think last year we had some five, five, six hundred private sector participants, but you are totally right that our idea with the World Walk of the Week is, of course, we have the scientific base, but we should bridge science to solutions through practitioners and also have people in the sector itself. So that, that is our aim. 
And let me also address one issue. Some of you have touched upon it, and also I think some of our colleague panelists, that is finance. And uh, we do see an increased interest from the financial sector also. It's, that means very early days in the water sector, because water compared to energy is mainly so far uh, financed through the public sector. But um, we do see with the increased demand on water resources, also a need for broadening the scope of finance. And there is now, as I mentioned this Monday morning when we discussed with the World Economic Forum, a increased uh, interest in the mere risk of supply crisis of water for the private sector. So it's coming up on the, on the, on the agenda for, for private sector more and more. And also when we discuss with the financial sector, so actually in, in CV we are starting a, a, a project together with the financial sector this coming fall to look into how we can both uh, find win-win situations where we get financial sector more involved and also come up with solutions or also a provision of financial sector tools to finance water in the future. So I hope we can report back and have some financial sector participants at next World Water Week. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else would like to take a <coughs> shot? Uh, with regard to, to solar energy and the discussion of that, of course, solar is very, very important. And, uh, and uh, solar, as we know, uh, especially when you got, get to places where, where there are summer houses and so on, then people in the industrialized countries use solar a lot for electricity. And then they have batteries for, uh, for uh, collecting this. This is quite expensive. And the problem in the developing countries is not uh, solved with uh, an energy source that is so difficult to preserve or to store. Solar thermal is, is great wherever you use it, because you can easily store the heat in, in water or some other media. And then uh, you get the heat when the sun is shining, and uh, you can uh, uh, use it for bath water or what have you, or heating during the night also, because you can store it. And uh, the, the big problem with solar is that it is not so reliable. The capacity factor is so small. And uh, to use so solar electricity where you have a grid, yes, you can add it to the grid. But uh, standalone uh, solar electricity, well, the battery producers, they have to, they, they really have to do some new inventions, I think, to make it uh, something that is reliable. But it is, it is marvelous when you use it uh, for where you have no other possibility. I, I have liked very much these, these uh, photos yeah. of, uh, of, uh, of camels with, uh, with solar screens where they're talk, taking medicine in developing countries so, sometimes, and then they are traveling by day, they are, they are keeping everything cool, but they can be used uh, in, in, in odd circumstances, but it is not in the way reliable that we want to have in our, in our general infrastructure. Thank you. Yes. Sorry. This is being webcast, so you need to use a mic. I'll, I'll come back to you in a, in a moment. There was one other, two other comments by a panelist, uh, Josefina and then John. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Um, I just want to, to come back to the question of the profit-driven approach and the, at the expense of the environment and how you can change that no, to some extent. Um, I suppose you refer mainly about the you know, industrial sector, the energy companies, and you know, what is their behavior. Uh, and I think that the way that the way is happening is obviously to, to, to encourage and to support social corporate responsibility. But there is no doubt that even in, that, in those terms, companies are, are really uh, do that because they have motives. E even when they, they improve social corporate responsibility activities, they, they have motives and many of them are benefits and profits. And what we have observed is that obviously, and that's what, what it was said before, is that um, uh, what the security is affecting the companies, and they are interested in, e even energy companies are interested in, in ensuring that, that, that water is managed properly. So there is a private interest to improve 
how manage how we are managed water and how you know whether is, there is more enough for the security and and I do know that there is some initiatives I'm not sure whether it's the same one that has been described before of improving precisely you know encouraging stewardship in relation to water and energy and and it's, it's starting but that's something that is is ongoing thank you John I, well actually I, I was going to address the same question because I thought it was sort of aimed at me and I th <laughs> thank Josephine for for picking it up. I, I can only uh, endorse what she said and just add to it that actually uh, uh, there have been a lot of sessions about private sector work here at this, this uh, conference this week, at least in my opinion. I think I've been to at least three of them. Um, and a lot of them have focused on this whole issue of CSR, corporate social responsibility. And um, rather than sort of saying it's a matter of philanthropy, you know, sort of throwing some money around to keep people happy, a lot of them now saying it is a real core business business practice, as you would do many other things in business, you do this. And yes, you do it because there's a good business case, um, and it may be driven by, as Josephine has said, uh, security, allocation of water, energy issues, and that sort of thing. It could also be driven by regulation and standards, but mm. companies are certainly getting it in the developed world anyway, that they have to think about these things and build them into their business as usual practice. It's not just a matter of, um, you know, so to say, going out and doing this philanthropically. There is a good business case. In the long run, it does benefit them. I think the, the difficulty is, is when you get into the small and medium-sized enterprises, which I mentioned earlier, that they don't have the resources and they don't have the motivations to do this. They're trying to just make ends meet. So it's a lot harder. And that is, I think, a challenge for, for many agencies working overseas as to how to deal with, with those industries. I've seen a lot of that firsthand and that's a, a, a difficult issue because they make a very big impact on water basins. The, 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 it's, I think the number is something like 70% of a lot of water basins are occupied by small and medium-sized en enterprises. So um, it's, it's a big, big issue. Yeah, right. Thank you. Uh, did any of the other panelists have a point? Yes. Uh, I'd just like to address maybe two, uh, two other questions that weren't addressed. The one, the first is the valuation of water. And um, you know, it's okay for energy is a tradable, marketable commodity. Water is seen as a right, but it also water is a, the, the water services is obviously there's a value to that. The water resource, which might or might not, which it would generally use to produce energy, might not be. Um, so. <laughs> It's, it, the valuation of water is a good idea fundamentally, but it's a really, really tricky issue. If, you, if, you're, if you're valuing what comes out of the tap that's been treated, that's been pumped, then that's, yeah, okay. That's, you can put some, if it's, if it's in its natural state, whether it's flowing or in a river or, uh, or in a lake or something, the, the valuation is very different. Now, Nexus versus IWRM. Um, well, I was never a big fan of IWRM, and the R stands for resources anyway. So if you're talking about the nexus between energy, really you're talking about energy, water services and energy, or you're talking about water resources to produce energy. So the IWRM doesn't quite fit uh, because of the R. Uh, whereas the nexus kind of looks at both water as, an ener as a service and uh, as, a, uh, as a resource. The other thing is that water, uh, energy is often outside of the basin. When you're talking about IWRM, you're really talking about basin level management. And energy can come from different sources in or outside the basin and can have impacts, water impacts, outside the basin in which you're operating or trying to do your IWRM. So it's a little bit, it's a little bit different. Um, the third thing is when we, we realized when we were writing the re report that this whole nexus movement that started, you know, maybe five, ten years ago, is actually replacing IWRM because IWRM is this all-encompassing, you know, uh, dogmatic thing. Whereas when this is, uh, where there's this nexus, whether it's the food water nexus, whether it's you know climate, food, energy, things like that, um, it, it narrows the scope. Whereas IWM is too broad. And the last point on that is that if you're looking at water, food, energy, climate change, um, environment, that nexus, the fact is water. Is this is this nexus? Water is the thing that connects all of these other sectors, and so 
this nexus approach is a way to bring in these these other sectors specifically one by one and instead of trying to just paint a picture across all of the all of those developmental domains okay very very interesting so if i were to use your venn diagram example as concepts uh, if you have iwrm and nexus there would be some overlap but they won't overlap completely with each other, if I understood correctly. That's the way I understand it. It's purely theoretical. Okay. And, and then to the question around valuation, what I would add is that there's also a heightened sense of political sensitivity around this whole debate about not just valuation, but uh, pricing is even more uh, uh, sometimes uh, politically toxic as a, as a topic to discuss, and, and which means sometimes it's challenging to uh, bring in a rational debate and, and uh, Rick is absolutely right this notion of uh, uh, the declaration of uh, water and sanitation as a human right in 2010 have sort of uh, amplified that that uh, discussion so there's actually a lot to be done there so uh, I, I saw the gentleman here wanted to come back and I'll then come back to you as well I just comment on the solar because what what I am discussing is not the big scale solar. For the rural Africa that is disconnected from everything, also grid, solar is solution. We have today we're providing water for hundred thousand people in Arid and Semi Arid in Kenya by using solar power only. And it's functioning very well. And they're not using any battery. What they are also doing actually now, they're using the solar panels for charging their mobile and the lamps. Because when the water tanks are full, the pumps stops, but solar panels is still producing energy. So you have to actually multiple impact by using the solar energy. So what I'm thinking is the small scale, not big scale providing water for 2 million people using, uh, uh, using solar, but small scale in rural area. Okay, thank you. The gentleman in the back. Uh, thank you. Um, I agree with Richard and Safar on that the uh, water valuation and pricing is a very thorny issue. Um, but it's been two decades since the Dublin principles and recently the water framework directive stressed the importance of using economic principles to as a mechanism for, for better water management. So if this fora are not used to move this topic forward um, and take the debate, even, however thorny it may be, then when are we going to be talking about these issues? Okay. So that's another check mark for Torgny uh, for next World Water Week, perhaps to have discussion around valuation. I should point out there was a session this morning uh, about private sector in, in water, and it dealt, the first half of it dealt with, uh, sorry, the second half dealt with valuation of water in business, and then the World uh, Business Council for Sustainable Development announced this guide and it's called business guide to water valuation and a lot of presentations went along with this talking about people sort of dealing with this subject and this is um, uh, their attempt to provide um, business with with a guideline as to how to deal with valuation and they went to globally and looked at I think something like 25 businesses all over the world and how they were doing it and utilities and so on um, I haven't had time to read it. I, I just glanced through the executive summary. But this is supposed to be a very good start because they were saying that five years ago, I think, at this conference, there was nobody really talking about this. And to have got this far, they were very happy. And they seem to be on the verge of saying it was, a, I think, a f they were leaning towards total economic m measurement or something like that. It's not my area. But, uh, or valuation. But a lot of it's described in this document, and I, I think you could probably get it straight off the website, or they may even have some copies still here um, for, for people. Thank you. Um, I'll give maybe the final question to the lady in the middle. Uh, you, you're okay. A any other? Yes. Okay, so you get the last question, and then I'll come round to the panelists to give maybe your one final round of one to two minute summary of what you take away and what you would like us to take away moving forward to the World Water Day next year. So, yes, sir. Go okay, ahead. so it's not really a question, it's more a comment. Um, Jan Lemoine from EDF, so private sector, uh, French electricity producer. Um, so, as uh, John Payne said, there is quite a lot of initiatives going on in the private sector, um, WBCSD in particular, and uh, initiatives 
to calculate water footprints for water footprints of uh, energy producing activities. And there's one in special in particular that I'm not sure um, whether you know about it, that's why I'm, I'm speaking today, uh, which was launched during the last World Water Forum in Marseille, um, 2012, and which objective is to try and establish a framework to calculate the water footprint, local water footprint, of any kind of energy production producing activity from coal extraction to nuclear power plants, for example, trying to um, produce a set of indicators which will reflect all the interactions between different kinds of water use, both on quantity and quality terms, with um, the environment. So I'm not going to speak about this here, it's not the point, but if uh, anybody, any, anyone is interested um, by this project, I'll be pleased to answer questions after. But just to say that things are going on in the private sector also, and because, well, I think private companies, well, I'm new in, in all this, but private companies uh, are more and more aware of the need to communicate and to report on these issues, and also for their own operations um, to manage the risk, reputational risk, supplier risk, um, regulatory risk. So I think even though it's always driven by profit. Um, th that's an important issue, and it's an important issue to come for, for most energy companies. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Well, I'll also park a final question with the panelists before I give you your, uh, your last word. One issue that we have not touched on is the uh, impact of climate change on both water and energy sectors. And the reason why I say this is I was involved in a study about three years ago in Canada where we asked different sectors to respond to what they thought was the biggest impact of climate change on their, on their sectors. And we had the nuclear thermal sector looking at it together. We also had hydropower sector looking at it. And both groups came back and said water was not really a concern for them vis-a-vis -vis climate change. This was somewhat surprising. But I, I would be interested if any of you have also encountered a similar um, experience and, and what is the reason for this kind of, uh, I would say, almost nonchalant attitude towards climate change impacts. So in this case, we'll start at the far end, uh, ladies first with Josefina, yeah. and we'll work our way uh, to this end. So let me understand the, the rule. Can we make our final statement or do you want an answer to that question? Well, if you can roll in both, uh, that would be wonderful. Well, for, for, the, um, for the question on climate, I think I will leave my partners to, say, to do that. But for my final um, message, I think uh, i like to, because I, I understand that we are trying also to build the messages for World Water Day. So for my final message, I think I would say that implementing the Nexus requires to deal with the partnership challenge. That would be my, my message. I think regulation is important. It's important to create an enabling environment and incentives. You know, some people were saying this here. But uh, realizing benefits requires a variable architecture of partnerships. And if we want to have the innovation, the ownership, the effectiveness, we have to, to, to ensure that, that we provide the kind of framework that is not too, too structured. It's partnerships will create that, that kind of innovation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, you did like, the climate as well. Uh, well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I think on the on the climate change one, just a, a brief comment. I, I, living in Canada too, I, I think people feel that we have lots of water there, and that is a bit of a fallacy. It, it seems the case, but it's a matter of availability. Um, so that message may not have got through in some ways, but I, I think the message on climate change has got through to municipalities. Mm -hmm. It may not be on industry, but I see a lot of requests both uh, in North America and also internationally, and, and you see it in Europe as well, uh, of uh, citizen towns wanting adaptation to climate change plans. These are coming out all the time. Everybody's got the message. Um, I listened to a talk about from somebody in Amsterdam last year and they were, were trying to predict what would happen if the sea level went up by so many feet or me well, meters. Sorry. Uh, so I think that message has got out to certain sectors, but perhaps not to others. And it, it is a matter of what, you know, what, what, when that impact suddenly arrives, as we see in terms of um, a scarcity hitting an, an industry, then people react, of course, when it gets to your own back, back door. Um, I suppose on the, the final thought, um, this, this conference has been a lot about cooperation. Um, that's the theme. And I think as far as we're talking about water and energy, um, I'm hoping that 
there's a sort of wake-up call to both sectors so that when they sort of sit down and say, okay, what am I going to do about water, in my case an in industry, or what am I going to do about energy, that they might suddenly think there may be some benefits to talking to the other guys, both in their own water box, in their own industry, and also outside in their, their, their river basins. And it's, it's a sort of bit like that analogy, you know, when we're all lining up for lunch, and we're all trying to get lunch together, and we're also rushing at the counter, and we all block one another, and no one's really getting lunch. But then somebody backs away and says, well, you go first, and then the line starts to work rather nicely. So that's the sort of, you know, concession we have to make to one another. You have to back off a little bit on your self-interest for the communal good. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ingvar. <clears throat> well, climate change, uh, there's been a lot of discussion over the last decade on this issue. But gradually, what we are seeing, the people who are, who are watching this and people writing about this, it's quite clear that this is happening uh, at a much uh, faster scale than, than we believed. And uh, even now, for instance, in, in my country, Iceland, which has been uh, living mainly on fish, this is affecting us already because uh, it seems and we hope that it is only temporarily, but we fear that it will continue, that the, the, the temperature of the sea uh, north of Iceland and south of Iceland has been changing. And uh, when the, the sea to the north, uh, as, as, it, uh, as the temperature goes up, then it is uh, melting more and more of the ice from the North Pole. And also there is more uh, ice being melted in the Greenland ice cap. And uh, in Iceland, our glaciers are, are uh, some disappearing and some, all of them going very much down. And all of this water is going into the sea, and uh, that changes the, the current. And so that uh, one of the main uh, uh, pelagic uh, fish stocks that we have been after in Iceland for, for decades, since we had the equipment to, to, to fish this, have, have disappeared south of the, south of the country, uh, south of the island. But uh, it is increasing up north, because certain fish species they are very choosy about the temperature of the water where they are. And the same you hear from, uh, from uh, scientists who are studying in the Himalayas. And uh, obviously, we have to do what is within our facilities to do to prevent this. We cannot prevent it, but we can, we can reduce the speed. And that is what the International Panel on Climate Change has been doing. And that is what we are trying to get the politicians to confirm uh, in, uh, in how to address this. It's really scary to hear what is happening in, in, in Siberia, in the permafrost areas there. There is so much of the permafrost areas there that they're giving much more water. This water is flowing into, into the North Polar Sea, into, into that area. And that is affecting this from there. And thus, the ice is melting faster. And it, it spreads really very, very fast. So that is why those of us who have devoted our professional life uh, in renewable energy sources that are uh, good as, as, as relates to this, for instance, with geothermal, it's ma mainly uh, used for heating. And uh, heating houses and cooling houses has been driven by fossil fuels in most countries of the world, and still is. And obviously, if we can reduce that by getting heat that has not been used through the centuries until now, then uh, that is a, that's a big issue. The same applies, of course, to use the solar and to use the, use the wind and all these renewables. And also the hydro. While we have some glaciers, while we have some water stored, we should definitely continue using it to produce electricity, which is not producing any greenhouse gases. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'll, in the interest of time, pass on to uh, Torgny.
Uh, I started off with uh, addressing three asymmetries between the energy sector and water sector, which is technology, institutions, and economic aspects. And having taken part in this session and listened to some other sessions during the last few days here at the World Water Week, I guess that uh, the economic aspects, the valuation, the pricing is a key driver to changes or adaptation in the first two, the technology and innovation. And here, of course, we should differentiate between water as a human right and as an economic good. Having said that, I think to price water is key, to price the ecosystem and give the true valuation. And that I look forward to for the next World Water Week and World Water Days to address this issue, this is specific issue. How do we price water in a way that we could have more efficient use given the increased demand and scarcity of water? Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Quickly on the climate change. Um, sure, I think people are already feeling the heat, especially in developing countries. And um, water is definitely the means through which most of the impacts are felt. And um, in, ne in Nepal, for example, the hydropower industry is already concerned about this as well. Um, there are studies that say that the hydropower potential of Nepalese rivers are going down by around 28% or so um, by the end of the century. But um, overall, I'd say that um, what the questions that were raised, the comments that, that came clearly um, pointed out that there is something going on, whether that be um, you know, tidal power or whether that be waste wa wa energy from wastewater or solar energy in, in the villages of Africa. Um, there are solutions out there. We need to work on it. And I think uh, on World Water Day uh, and World Water Week, uh, we should um, try to, I agree with the gentleman's comment that we should um, try to focus on solutions. And uh, World Water Day could be seen as an um, event where we um, raise awareness on the solutions to this nexus. Thank you. I, I, I think my message here is that uh, looking at the region I came from, the Eastern Africa region, there is a clear need to expand the, the energy system. And there is also a need to pursue a more uh, efficient linkage between the water and the energy systems in the future. So there is a need to develop capacity at, a, at an expert's level as well as at the political level to, because there are a lot of decisions to be made soon in uh, expanding those sectors given the level of electrification, the level of uh, generation, etc. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Nick, you have the last word. Thanks. Um, just quickly for the climate change, I, there's, there's also not just the impacts, but there's adaptation and mitigation. And you used to say adaptation is about water because the impacts are about water. And that mitigation is on the energy side. But with the, you know, exploring this water energy nexus, you realize that there are water impacts to the energy, your choices or your energy mix. So the energy can be, or sorry, water can be considered as a facilitator as much as a uh, the sort of a, uh, a fence or um, a barrier. Uh, for my, in terms of the overall statement or something, I'd, one thing that I, that came back with the comments and it kept coming back is that we've got different scales of problems and different scales of solutions. Uh, with the World Water Development Report, we're really looking at a global, you know, a, a global aspect. But clearly, um, you know, at a, there's local level, um, you know, interventions that can be done, whether it's solar or what have you, that might not appear on a global map or a global pie chart. But that doesn't mean they're not important, and it doesn't mean there should not be a place for them to be discussed. I'm just wearing the World Water Development hat, so these things kind of fall on the wayside because they're the piece of, slice of pie is just so small. But it doesn't mean it's not important. And finally, since I do have the very last word, I'd like to invite you all tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock um, beyond, it's water and energy beyond the nexus. So we're going to actually have uh, more, or my colleague here, and a few other people from the energy, uh, from the energy um, milieu. Uh, we'll have um, someone from the World Bank who will be discussing these water and energy co-projects on desal and energy from wastewater, these things that came up today. So I invite you all to join us tomorrow at 9. And well, uh, thank you, Adil. Thank you very much, Rick. Uh, again, we had a very interesting discussion. I thank you very much for uh, engaging with us and those who are watching us remotely through our webcast. We also thank them for their interest.
uh, for me, it was extremely illuminating, and uh, I can't tell you how much I've been educated by, by this panel. Uh, and it has also given us some very interesting thoughts of how to organize the World Water Day and what kind of issues would we need to take forward. Uh, I will not try to summarize any of the discussion. We have a colleague here from UN Water who's helping us uh, pull together these ideas. These will be put online on the World Water Day website. Uh, and we will take up the, the, the concepts and ideas with us uh, to Tokyo and to elsewhere, uh, wherever the uh, water energy nexus is discussed uh, on, on the World Water Day next year. Thank you very much. Please join me in giving a warm round of applause to our panelists. Thank you.